Welcome to Building an RPG with Unity 5.x, video course by Pact Publishing. I am Adam, and I will be Vahi's voice for this course. Vahi Karamayan is a software consultant and author based in Los Angeles, California. He has provided software development services to some of the top pharmaceutical, biotech, and medical device manufacturing companies in the world. His latest clients include departments of planning and evox imaging. He provides web, mobile and virtual reality experiences. He came across Unity when he was searching for a game engine for his projects in 2010. The rest is history. He is the founder of Granada Hills Unity user group and actively works with the user community to educate new developers. Vahi holds a master's degree in computer science and is currently lecturing the following topics. Introduction to Computer Science, Data Structures and Algorithms, Operating Systems, and Game Design and Development. Unity is one of the most cutting-edge game engines in the world. Developers are looking for the best ways to create games of any genre in the engine. This comprehensive course on building an RPG with Unity teaches you high-end techniques currently used in developing modern games. Tips, tricks and techniques that can be applied to your own RPG. In the first section, we will learn the necessary parts of building an RPG, such as structuring the game environment. Section 2 will be based on different character definitions we are going to be using for our game and character data. In section 3, we will see how to customise the player and non-player characters. In section 4, we will explore game master and game mechanics, add more features to it, and make the game more interesting. In section 5, we will create a simple generic inventory system that can be used in our game. In section 6, we will be improving our game's user interface and feedback system. In the last section, we will be able to implement multiplayer mode for your RPG games to create your own game experience. If you have always wanted to create a high-end RPG using Unity, then this video course is for you. Prior knowledge of game development is required and experience working with Unity will be beneficial. You will learn how to construct a framework for inventory, equipment, characters, enemies, quests and game events. Also discover how to load and unload scenes and assets. Later in the course we will be able to create multiplayer game settings for our RPG and design a UI for user input and feedback. You will learn how to enhance Game Master to handle all aspects of the RPG. As we progress, you will be able to develop a custom pathfinding system and implement AI for character and non-player characters. This step-by-step -step video tutorial will teach you how to build a multiplayer RPG. In this video course, you will explore the core concepts of the typical strategies you might need to build a complete game. All the sections in this course require Unity 5.4 or above. We will also need an IDE for editing of the C-sharp. This can be done using any text editor, but it is recommended to use Visual Studio on the Windows platform, or Mono Develop or Code on Mac OS X. We will require Windows 10 64-bit or above, or Mac OS X. So, let's begin this journey together. I hope to see you there. Hi, and welcome to the first section of this course, Setting the Atmosphere. In this section, we're going to start laying the groundwork for our own RPG. We will first define the story of our game, define the plot, and define the quest that will make the game playable. We will look at the assets that will be required to create an environment and characters and finally design the first level. Now we will see the video of section 1, Characteristics of an RPG. In this video, we will learn how roleplay video games typically rely on a highly developed story and setting, which is divided into a number of quests or levels. Players typically control one or more characters by issuing commands, which are then performed by player characters based on their defined abilities and attributes. Throughout the game, these attributes increase or decrease and set the personality of the character. An RPG usually also has more complex and dynamic interaction mechanics defined and developed between the player character and the world which they are immersed within. These include the interaction with the world environment and also other non-character players defined within the world. Due to these factors, 
there is usually more time allocated to design and develop the code base which deals with the behavior and artificial intelligence, AI, handling such events throughout the game. Key elements of an RPG. Story and setting. Exploration and quests. Items and inventory. Character development. Experience and levels. Combat. User interface and graphics. Story and setting. The premise of most role-playing games tasks the player with saving the world, or whichever level of society is threatened. There are often twists and turns as the story progresses, such as the surprise appearance of estranged relatives, or enemies who become friends, or vice versa. The game world tends to be set in a historical, fantasy, or science fiction universe, which allows the players to do things they cannot do in real life, and helps the players suspend their disbelief about the rapid character growth. As stated previously, RPGs are heavily invested in storytelling. This is one of the main, key entertaining factors of the genre. Due to this fact, when you are developing your RPG, you will need to pay close attention to how you develop your story and the characters that are within your story. This in turn translates into the kind of environments and settings you will have for your game and the characters within the game. Traditionally, RPGs progress the plot based on decisions that the player character makes during gameplay. This puts a great deal of pressure on the game designer who needs to be able to integrate such forks in the gameplay with the main storyline of the game. This also raises the issue of how to program the game to take into consideration all the different paths within the story. To make the game more interesting and attractive, the game designer can introduce special triggers within the story to make it more interesting or challenging. This is usually done by introducing new characters and or areas to discover within the existing level. Exploration and Quests The whole idea behind an RPG is the ability for the player to have the freedom to explore the world which they have been immersed into. The more well-defined the world is, the more interesting it will be for the player to explore, and in return retain their curiosity and engagement throughout the gameplay. This is achieved by the narrative of the story developed for the RPG. Players will be specifically given the opportunity to walk around the world and explore their surroundings in order to meet their objectives. In an open world RPG, the player is free to roam in the world after they have met their objectives set by the storyline. In such cases, the player can still explore any area which is no longer needed for the continuation of the quest, but they can spend time exploring the area and maybe meet some other non-player characters that they had not previously met whilst completing their mission. But generally speaking, this is not done by the player. Once they meet their objective, they are eager to move on to the next quest, hence the question is, how much time and effort do the game designers and developers apply to a region after the main objective is met? The answer would be not much. Historically, the player follows a linear sequence of quests in order to realize their goals and objectives within the game. To make the game more engaging, the developer can introduce mini quests within the main plot of the game at the particular location to give the player the ability to explore and gain more skills and or abilities. Since these are not part of the main storyline, they can be triggered any time a player enters a specific area. For instance, assume the player has completed the main objective of the level, and is ready to move on to the next objective. Now, imagine that we have created an open world environment where the user can revisit the world any time they choose. If the player decides to go back and explore a certain area of the world they have just completed, and they happen to trigger the event to launch this mini quest, wouldn't that be a great surprise for the player? Keep in mind that these mini quests should not affect the main storyline, but they can be used to enhance the player's experience. These types of decisions are important when you're developing your game. If they choose not to take on the challenge, you should not penalize them. Except if you want to be really mean. Quests may involve defeating one or many enemies, rescuing a non-player character, item fetch quests, or location puzzles such as mysteriously locked doors. Inventory system. One of the main functions and features of an RPG is the inventory system. Throughout the game, the user will come across a vast number of collectible items that can be used for different purposes within the game to help them progress through their journey. Therefore, RPGs need to provide mechanics to help the player store, retrieve, and organize the content relevant to their journey. When the player is progressing through their journey in an RPG, they interact with the world they are immersed in. The storyline of the game usually forces the player to interact with the surrounding world and other non-player characters. 
These interactions are usually in the form of some sort of an exchange. Whether this exchange is done through narration, to provide the player with a better sense of the quest, or real exchange in terms of items, is up to the game designers and developers. The game needs a way to keep track of all the interactions between the player character and everything and everyone else. One system that is used to keep track of this interaction is the inventory system. During the gameplay, players usually start off as a very simple character, and part of the gameplay is to elevate their character by exploring the world and collecting items that will help them increase their skills and abilities. For instance, a player can start their journey with very basic clothes. Throughout the quest, they will either interact with a non-player character, such as a merchant, who will provide them with a better set of clothes and or some sort of weapon to get them started. These items will be stored and managed by the inventory system. The simplicity or the complexity of the inventory system will be defined by the complexity of the game and the complexity of the character within the game. In our game, we will be designing and developing a generic inventory system that can be applied to many different types of items. Character development. As with any other part of the RPG development, character attributes and actions are highly defined by the storyline of the game. These actions in turn are performed indirectly within the game when the player commands the character to perform a specific task. For instance, in a given RPG, there is going to be at least a couple of character classes. The following are some sample class types. Barbarians, Orcs, Magicians or Wizards, Zombies, Humans. Each character class might even have subclasses of their own with its own uniquely defined attributes. Again, this will be tightly coupled to your storyline for your RPG. For instance, the player character is technically the hero of our story and of the game. The hero is usually of a certain character class. Let's assume the hero is part of the human class. The human class or race then will have some specific characteristics that will be inherited by the player character or any other non-player character of the same type or class. The character class and race usually determines the abilities of a character within the game, which then defines the type of actions the character can perform. This is another key area where an RPG designer will have to spend a lot of time defining and specifying the design and development of the characters within the game. The sky is the limit when it comes to designing and defining your characters, but there are some key attributes that you will need to consider for any RPG. Most RPGs allow the player to modify their characters before the game starts, or even during gameplay. By default, every character class will have some default attributes that the player is allowed to adjust values based on some modifier. The basic fundamental features allowed for modification are the sex, class, or race of a character. Experience and leveling. To engage the player and to get them hooked on the game, game designers use mechanics to enhance the performance of the player character. This progress is what is termed leveling or experience in RPGs. Leveling and experience are key elements of any role-playing game. Any good leveling or experience tree will be defined for any RPG. This allows the player to develop their avatar through gameplay and become functionally more powerful by gaining more skills points and other resources necessary to complete their quest. To acquire new weapons, armor, clothing, and or any other gameplay items defined in the world, the player will need to meet some specific thresholds within the game. These thresholds can be a combination of the player's acquired experience points, financial gains, or a combat experience. There is no right or wrong when it comes to designing any of these hierarchies and or systems. You will need to see which one works for your specific needs and how best to apply them. In RPGs, the progress of the character player is measured by counting some defined attributes specified by the game designer. Usually, the advancements are defined by the player completing a certain task to get experience points, and slowly the tasks and the point rewards are increased throughout the game. The player can then use the experience points to enhance his or her avatar within the game. Again, this is highly integrated with the storyline character classes and or race the player has selected. Some common ways to acquire points are by killing enemies, combating non-player characters, no importance, and performing quests that have been defined within the game. In this video course, we will be using a real-time combat system. Real-time combat imports features from action games and creates a hybrid 
of action and RPG genre. Action RPG combat systems combine the RPG mechanics of role-playing with the direct, reflex-orientated, arcade-style, real-time combat systems of action games, instead of the more traditional battle systems of RPGs. User Interface and Graphics For instance, when designing your characters and or 3D models for the game, if you know that you're going to be using isometric view, then you will approach your modeling differently to, for instance, when you are designing for a first person or third person camera. In our game, we will be using third person camera for the presentation of our world. Role playing games require the player to manage a large amount of information and frequently make use of windowed interfaces to arrange the data for the player. This is usually designed and implemented through a heads up display, HUD. The HUD is frequently used to simultaneously display several pieces of information, including the main character's health, items, and indication of game progression. You can think of the HUD as the access point for all the information the user will be required to have access to and interact with during gameplay. The design of the HUD is crucial for RPG games. Typically, there are a few key data elements that you would like to continuously communicate with the player throughout the gameplay. These data points are health, energy, stamina, active weapon, active shield, special items, number of lives, access to main menu, access to inventory, access to skills. Once again, the design of your HUD is derived from the type of the game you are designing and also the type of information that will be required to be available to the player during gameplay. Since most RPGs collect and store large amounts of data for the player character, it is very important to create an easy to use yet clean HUD. A very important thing to remember when designing a HUD is it should never overpower the screen or become a distraction. It usually takes a few stabs to come up with a great HUD design for your game. From initial artistic concepts to the actual implementation and testing by gamers to get some feedback before finalizing the design and internal workings. Creating a HUD that will fit into the gameplay and style of your game is essential. While a feature rich HUD may be great for some games, a simplistic HUD can be just as effective or more. It all depends on the player experience you want. So when you're ready to create the HUD for your next game, make sure you're designing the HUD to enhance the player's experience and never give the player an overload of information. Nice, we have learned about characteristics of an RPG. In the next one, we'll learn about patterns in RPG. Hi again, and welcome to the video with the first section, patterns in RPG. In the previous video, we have learned about the characteristics of an RPG. Now, we will see more about the patterns in RPG. In this video, we will be looking at some of the design patterns that have been identified and that can be utilized for your own games. Now you start a new project, regardless of what type of a project, you need to have some clear idea of what exactly it is that you are trying to accomplish. This is even truer for designing a game, since designing a game has many different components to it. You will need to identify what your game is going to be about. Some questions to start the thinking process are What are you trying to accomplish? What mood are you trying to evoke? What do the characters do? What does the player or players in a multiplayer environment do? What kind of activities do you want to reward? And what kind of rewards do you want to provide? What age group does your game target? Is your game going to have cinematic sequences? Will the game and the story extend with supplemental assets? These are all important questions that will affect the design of your game. As you see this section, keep a pen and paper handy so that you can write down all ideas that flash in your mind. This way, you can keep track of all your thoughts and if you need to expand on them, you can at a later time. Terminology. Every discipline has its own terminology. The following is a list of terminology that is used in RPG games. It's a good idea to take a moment and study them to expand your vocabulary or to refresh your memory. Attribute. A gauge that is a common characteristic, a commonality. Character. A person in a game portrayed by a player, including possibly the game master. Characteristics. An aspect of a character. 
a character's name, height, age, beauty, and strength are some possible characteristics. Common characteristics. A characteristic common to all characters of a given type in a game. A character's name, height, age, beauty, and strength are frequently common characteristics. Conflict. Contention between characters, players, and or game forces, especially contention that shapes the game's plot. This includes oppositions between two or more players concerning what facts should be introduced into a game world. Contest. A conflict that is resolved through mechanical means. Derived attributes. An attribute whose value is determined by a formula. Typically, the formula uses other attribute values to generate a number. Drama. An outcome based purely on story consideration. Outcomes in a drama are exclusively determined by what would be most entertaining for the participants. Flaw. A selected characteristic that is specifically not also a gauge. A character either has a flaw or he does not. Flaws are structurally very similar to gifts, but flaws are generally considered detrimental to a character rather than beneficial. Fortune. An outcome that is at least partly based on random factors. This may include rolling dice, drawing cards, or some other random value generator. Game Master. Traditionally, a player assigned responsibilities and who manages the game flow. With computer RPGs, the Game Master, GM, is the glue that holds everything together. Gauge, a graduated value generally associated with a name. Commonly, the graduated values are numeric values. Gift, a selected characteristic that is specifically not a gauge. A character either has a gift or not. In general, gifts are considered beneficial to a character's well-being. Karma, an outcome based on non-random value comparison. A karma-based contest directly compares two values to determine an outcome. Non-player character, NPC. Any character portrayed by the Game Master as part of the role. Optional characteristics. A characteristic that is not common to all characters of a given type. Player. Any person participating in a role-playing game. Player character, PC. A character portrayed by any player while not assuming the role of a Game Master. Primary attribute. An attribute whose value is set directly by a player rather than being derived by a formula from other attributes. Commonly, primary attributes are used in formulae to determine the values of derived attributes, but their own values are not determined by formulas. Typically, they are generated by random numbers or set by spending some resources. Rank. The specific value of a gauge skill, handicap, or rank trait also uses an adjective in place of gauge when describing such skills and traits. Ranked trait. A trait that is also a gauge. Selected characteristic. A characteristic selected from a predefined list of choices. Shared gauge. A gauge that is shared by many characters. Skill. A selected characteristic that is also a gauge and is generally considered beneficial to a character. Trait. A characteristic made up by a player without drawing it from a predefined list of choices. To get a better understanding about the relationships between the attributes and characteristics, we have to put together a visual diagram to make it explainable. Contest tree. The intent of a contest tree is to provide a mechanical means to create rising tension within a game. This is also known as escalating conflict. Contest trees are high level conflict resolution systems made up of many levels of contests arranged in hierarchical fashion. The way they work is that lower level contests feed the higher level contests and therefore affect the outcome of the higher level contests. In other words, the higher level contest could be to kill the big boss. But before you get to the big boss, there could be other mini battles that you will have to complete. And the outcome of the mini battles will drive the outcome of the big battle. To give a simple example would be by the amount of experience points you have gained before reaching the main boss. It is best to use a contest tree when you want to create a sense of rising tension in your game. 
This can be achieved by applying different mechanics as the player progresses through the levels. Creating suspense in an RPG is very simple as you have a lot of control in the way levels and gameplay are designed. Since we have the ability to create our 3D world as we like it, it would be easy to incorporate suspense into the game. A few key points for creating tension in your game. The hero and enemy should be evenly matched. The hero and enemy should both periodically fail in their attempts, providing they are worthy adversaries. The hero and enemy's successes and failures are never so great that all hope of success of attaining the high level goals is eliminated from either side. A highlight concern in contest trees is that it can only resolve high level conflicts dealing with the mechanical inputs by the system. That is, if damage and remaining hit points are the only gauges used as an input into a conflict resolution, then the mechanics can only resolve issues dealing with damage and hit points. When designing a flexible contest tree, you will need to consider both the inputs and also the outputs. Negotiated Contest A negotiated contest provides a mechanical means to resolve disputes where the set of inputs and possible outcomes is negotiated by the player and non-player characters specifically for the conflict. Designing and developing a negotiated contest mechanism is pretty complex. In order for the pattern to work properly, you will need to consider all of the inputs and outputs for the negotiations. The challenge of developing such a system is not so much the actual technical implementation, but the database that you will have to create and retain based on the available selection by the player and the outcome of each input. Negotiation can be a great mechanic for exchanging information with non-player characters in your role-playing game. There are three parts to a negotiation pattern. Initiation is the phase at which a character action is introduced into the game world. Execution is the phase in which the success or failure of a character action is determined. Effect is the phase in which the results of a character's actions are determined. Here are some questions to consider when designing a negotiation system. What does the winner get? What does the loser get? How do we know who's the winner and who's the loser? What do we need to establish before resolution begins? And how? Awesome! In this video we have successfully learned about patterns in RPG. In the next video, we'll see about existing or upcoming RPG games. Welcome to the next video of Section 1, Existing or Upcoming RPG Games. In the previous video, we have learned how to play with variables and environment variables. We will take a look at some of the existing or upcoming RPGs on the market. The main idea behind this section is to provide you with a point of reference on multiple RPGs and the game design implemented. It is also a good idea to research existing or upcoming games to get ideas of your own. Dark Souls 3 Dark Souls 3 is an action role playing game developed by From Software and published by Bandai Namco Entertainment for PlayStation 4. Xbox One and Microsoft Windows. It was released in Japan in March of 2016 and worldwide in April of 2016. The game is set in the Kingdom of Lothric, an undead warrior known as the Ashen One is tasked by a mysterious woman known as the Firekeeper to avert an oncoming apocalypse brought about by the ongoing conflict between light and dark. But the only means to avert this event is with the destruction of the Lords of Cinder previous heroes who have linked the first flames across eons. The game is set in a third person perspective. Players are equipped with a variety of weapons including bows, explosive firebombs, great swords and dual wielded swords to fight against enemies. Shields are used to deflect an enemy's attack and protect the player from suffering damage. Throughout the game, players encounter different types of enemies, each with different behaviours some change their combat pattern during battles. New combat features are introduced into the game, including weapon and shield skill, which are special abilities that vary from weapon to weapon that enable unique attacks and features at the cost of focus points. The game puts more focus on role playing, in which the character builder is expanded and weapons are improved to provide more tactical options to players. Fallout 4 
Fallout 4 is an action role playing game developed by Bethesda Game Studios and published by Bethesda Softworks. The game was released worldwide on November the 10th, 2015 for Microsoft Windows, PlayStation 4 and Xbox One. The game takes place in the year 2287, 10 years after the events of Fallout 3 and 210 years after a resource war over natural resources that ended in a nuclear holocaust in 2077. The setting is a post-apocalyptic retro future, covering a region that includes Boston, Massachusetts and other parts of New England known as the Commonwealth. The story begins on the day the bombs dropped, October 23rd, 2077. The player's character takes shelter in Vault 111, emerging exactly 210 years later, on October 23rd, 2287. The game takes place in an alternative version of history that sees the 1940s and 1950s aesthetics, design and technology advance in the direction imagined at the time. The resulting universe is thus a retro-futuristic one, where the technology has evolved enough to produce laser weapons, manipulate genes and create nearly autonomous artificial intelligence, but all within the confines of 1950s solutions like the widespread use of atomic power and vacuum tubes, as well as having the integrated circuitry of the digital age. The overall setting of the game is that of the 1950s, from the architecture to the advertisements and general living styles, and so on. Divinity Original Sin Divinity Original Sin is a single player and cooperative multiplayer fantasy role-playing game developed by Larian Studios. The game ships with the editor that created the game, allowing players to create their own single player and multiplayer adventures and publish them online. The customizable protagonists of the game are a pair of source hunters, members of an organization dedicated to eradicating a dangerous magic named the Source and its adepts, the Sorcerers. In the single player mode, the player controls them both while in the multiplayer mode, each player takes control over one of them. At the start of the game, the source hunters receive orders to investigate the murder of a town councillor by a suspected sorcerer in Sicil, a port town in southern Rivalon. Upon arrival, they find Sicil under siege by orcs and undead, and soon discover that it was orchestrated by a sorcerer, conspiracy linked to the Immaculates, a cult based in the Lakula forest further inland. Awesome! In this video we've successfully learned about existing or upcoming RPG games. In the next video, we'll see how to build our RPG. Welcome to the next video of Section 1, building our RPG by using the story of Zazar Dynasty. In the previous video, we learned about existing or upcoming RPG games. In this video, we will establish some key elements for our RPG and we will create a game based story. Building our RPG As discussed, building a role-playing game is no small task, but once you start down the path, you will come to realise that it is not as difficult as it seems initially. The idea is to get started, and as you put your ideas down on paper and start the design process, more and more ideas will come into perspective. As we have learned, there are some key elements that we would need to establish for our RPG. Let's recall them and maybe even fine-tune them as we go along. Key elements Story and setting Exploration and quests Inventory system Character development Experience and leveling Combat system User interface and graphics The story of Zazar Dynasty The premise of most role-playing games tasks the player with saving the world. There are often twists and turns as the story progresses, such as the surprise appearance of an estranged relative or enemies who become friends and vice versa. We will create our story and game based on such a story. Plot Once upon a time there was a great kingdom, ruled by the great King Zazar. The ruler of the kingdom was a generous lord to his subjects. The kingdom, under the rule of Zazar, was peaceful and prosperous. However, over time internal family rivalries and struggles caused cracks in the strong bond that kept the kingdom intact. Due to mysterious events, the great king decided to move his family away from the kingdom and trust his son 
with one of his trusted wise elders. The kingdom was never the same. Until now. Exploration and Quests Now that we have defined our plot for the game, we can start working on developing the story further and breaking it down into different levels. To keep things simple, we will concentrate on basic quests and level design. The important point is to understand the concepts and apply them to your own story. Awakening The game will start by immersing the player in the environment where our hero has been raised and trained by the elder who was entrusted by the great King Zazar. The main objectives of this level will be for the player to engage with the environment and learn how to interact with his or her surroundings. Objectives Introduce the player to the user interface. How to move the character. How to interact with non-player characters. How to interact with the environment. Outcome Players get points for completing in-game tasks. Player gets his first weapon. Player learns how to interact with the surrounding world. The village. Our hero will start his journey of self-fulfillment. He will be travelling in the outskirts of the kingdom and arriving at one of the villages that has been terrorised by the thugs and mercenaries hired by the evil overlord, Shaquille. Our hero, himself unaware of who he is and why he is on this journey, will find out about the austerity that has been going on since the departure of his father. This will be mostly accomplished through the interaction of the village peasants. The primary objective of this level will be for the player to learn social skills and engage with the village people and create relationships. Rumour has it that there are spies in the village and that everyone is suspicious of each other and the unity that once was the strength of the village is crumbling. Objectives Interact with the village peasants to acquire social skills. Create trust between the hero and the villagers. Seek out who the spy is among the villagers. Outcome Improved social skills. Establish relationships that can be tapped into at a later point. Learn some basic combat skills. Broken Forest, the Horizon. Our hero will be travelling along his quest into the Horizon. The Horizon is the initial exposure to the main kingdom's borders, where the main castle and inner city is within reach. It is basically a vast lush forest that protects the main domain of the kingdom from outside threats. It also has a few secrets and surprises for the uninitiated passerby. The forest is where the barbarians reside and cause havoc on the surrounding areas. What is not apparent at the time is the connection between the barbarians and the current overlord of the kingdom. As far as the hero is concerned, he or she will need to be able to safely pass through the forest. The horizon is going to have several unexpected surprises for the hero. The outcome of the quest will heavily rely on the way the player interacts with the surrounding environment and also with the non-player characters. Objective Ability to pass through the forest without getting killed Outcomes Hero can be captured by the barbarians. Hero could face other life-threatening scenarios and or non-player characters. Hero successfully passes through the forest and is ready to take on the next challenge. The Kingdom The hero has progressed through the previous quests and is now ready to take down the evil overlord and retake what is inherently his. Our hero has progressed and acquired a vast amount of skills and abilities throughout the quests, and now he is going to undertake one of the most difficult and epic battles in the game. Our hero is surprised by the vast army of the overlord. He will need to figure out a way to pass through the city and into the main castle to defeat the enemy. Objectives Kill the overlord and retake his kingdom. Outcomes Call to action the relationships he had established throughout gameplay. Use his negotiation skills and wisdom to outwit more powerful enemies. Destroy the enemy. Ah, the pure joy of defeating your nemesis and taking over your kingdom. Awesome! In this video, we have successfully learned how to build our RPG and create our own story. In the next video, we'll learn about asset inventory. Hi, and welcome to the next video of Section 1, Asset Inventory. In the previous video, we have learned how to build our RPG and create our own story. Let's move on to the topic. In this video, we will discuss some of the basic assets that are going to be required for the development of our RPG. Our game assets are defined by the scenes we describe for our game. For our RPG, we have described four unique scenes. 
Each one has been described in enough detail for us to get an idea of the types of assets we are going to require. Environment Assets The general theme of our game is going to be medieval. There are several ways to go about this. The first and preferred way would be to either create yourself the environment models by yourself or a teammate. Second, to find a freely available model that has been created by a third party. Or third, to purchase the 3D models that have been created by a third party. The asset store is a great place for you to start hunting for great content if you do not have the ability to create your own 3D models. You can use the asset store to search for medieval themed environments that can be used for the game. One of my favourites is called Medieval Environment. You might want to consider searching for a few more that are to your liking and taste. Things to consider as part of your environment assets. Buildings, props and add-ons, banners, barrels, windows, boxes and wagons. Rocks, plants and trees. Particle assets, fire, fog, smoke, water. Skyboxes. The preceding list is just a starting point, but it is a starting point for your environment assets. Character assets. RPGs are heavily based on characters, therefore the next important game asset is going to be the characters themselves. The models you need to define for your game are again heavily related to your storyline and setting. The asset store provides a wealth of character models that you can download and use as a proof of concept for your game. For our game, here are the characters that are required. Humans. These will represent the hero as well as the villagers and other non-player character types of human. We need a barbarian class. These are some of the characters that the hero must confront during the gameplay. We have the orc character class, which are animals in their own right. You can either get the free models or the paid models to represent your characters. We will get more into the character assets in future sections. Awesome! In this video we have successfully learned about asset inventory. Hope you enjoy watching this video. In the next video, we'll see about level designs. Hi, and welcome to the next video of section one, level design. In the previous video, we have learned about asset inventory. Now that we have our game story on paper and have an idea of what we want to achieve, it is time to apply our skills to actually making it happen. Now that we have our game story on paper and have an idea of what we want to achieve, it is time to apply our skills to actually making it happen. To get started, we need to launch Unity. I'm using the 64-bit edition of Unity 5.4.2. You do not need to have the pro version of Unity for completing the project. Go ahead and select a location and a name you desire for your project and select the Create Project button. At this point, Unity will create an empty project for you and display the Unity IDE. It should look something like the following. Your view might be a bit different depending on how you have configured your Unity layout. If this is the first time you have launched Unity, you will need to get up to speed with the basics, since we are not going to be covering them in this video course. If you have not used Unity before, you should get familiar with the IDE before you continue on reading. Setting the stage. So the first things we would like to do is to create a landscape for our first level called Awakening. Unity itself has some good tools for creating terrains, but truth be told, it is not a practical means of achieving nice beautiful terrains for the game. For this purpose we are going to use another set of tools called Terrain Toolkit, and it was developed by Sander as part of the Unity Summer of Code 2009. The toolkit is available on Google Code Repository. I have also included the library as part of the download provided by this book, just in case the original link gets deprecated in the future. Once you get the zip file containing the terrain toolkit, go ahead and unzip it to a desired location on your computer. Drill down in the extracted folder to get to the Unity package called Terrain Toolkit underscore one underscore zero underscore two dot Unity Package. At this point, let's take a moment and go back into Unity and actually create a terrain game object and see the built in tool for terrain modification. To 
create a terrain, you will need to select the following from your main menu, Game Object, 3D Object, Terrain. This will create a default terrain in your scene, which should look something like the following. When you select the Terrain Game Object in the Hierarchy window, you will see the Inspector window displaying the properties and components that are accessible through the designer for the Terrain Game Object. As you can see, there are lots of attributes that you can modify and by doing so create a nice looking terrain. When you start playing around with the terrain tool, you will soon realize that it is not practical for large terrain models or for natural looking terrains. To enhance our terrain generation, we will use the terrain toolkit. The first thing we need to do is to import the Unity package into our project. And this is done by selecting from the main menu, Assets, Import Package, Custom Package, which will open up your File Explorer. Using the File Explorer, you will need to navigate to the location where you extracted the zip file and select the Unity package to import. If all goes well, you will see the following screen displaying the assets that are included in the package we are trying to import. You can take a look at the content of the package before importing it. In our case, we want to import everything, so we can just click the Import button. Sometimes when you import older Unity assets, Unity will prompt you to automatically upgrade it to the latest version. This is usually okay, so just accept it and let Unity do what it needs to do. When Unity imports the Terrain Toolkit, you will notice a new folder under your project window called Terrain Toolkit. All the code will be listed under the folder if you want to make any modifications to it. There is also a README file which you can use to get started. You will also notice that a new Unity Editor feature has been added under the component menu called Terrain, Terrain Toolkit. All you need to do to apply the Terrain Toolkit to your existing terrain is to select that option and it will automatically attach the correct component to the Terrain Game object for you. You will notice a few options that are now available to you through the Terrain Toolkit for the generation of more natural and realistic terrains. You should take the time and get familiar with each attribute and play around with the values to get an idea of how they affect the terrain generation algorithm. The Awakening The setting in the atmosphere of the level is going to be a secluded area within the jungle. We are now going to generate our terrain using the terrain toolkit discussed in the previous section. By default, the scene is just going to have a camera and a directional light game object defined. You can save your scenes and assets within the asset folder without much thought. However, it is usually a good idea to have some file structure in place to make organization of your assets easier and be able to find them faster. A preferred folder structure would include scenes, prefabs, textures, audio, models. Within each folder you can then create subfolders and so forth for your own organizational purposes. Now we are ready to add a terrain game object to the scene. Go ahead and select Game Object, 3D Object, Terrain. This will place a terrain game object in the scene. Double click on the terrain game object in the hierarchy window to make it centered in the scene view. By default, the terrain object will be very large. Let's go ahead and make some adjustments before we do anything else. To make the adjustments to the terrain size, select the settings icon as indicated in the preceding screenshot. This will display the basic attributes of the terrain. 
As you can see, there are a bunch of properties that can be adjusted to make it behave to your liking. We are mostly concerned with the size of the terrain and also the maximum height that the terrain can rise to. Therefore, scroll down until you get to the resolution section. Change the terrain width and the terrain length to 50. Change the terrain height to 50. This will change the dimension so that we can handle our scene easier. Our original terrain size was very large and it would have taken us a long time to decorate it. Now we have a good sized terrain. Assuming you have already imported the terrain toolkit, go ahead and select Component, Terrain, Terrain Toolkit from the main menu. I have used the Fractal Terrain Generator function with a delta of 0.4 and blend of 0.445. This will generate a nice looking terrain with a good proportion of hills and valleys. Since the terrain is randomly generated, yours may not look exactly like mine. I usually apply the smooth filter after my terrain generation to make things look even nicer. After applying the smooth filter, my terrain looks like the following. You can see the difference of the filter once it has been applied. Let's go ahead and now apply some textures to make it nice. Selecting the texture tab within the terrain toolkit, you will have several options. We would like to apply at least two textures to give our terrain a more realistic look. You can apply up to four textures if you choose to. Click the add texture button twice to create the texture placeholder. Textures are very important in graphics and especially games. The better and higher resolution your textures, the better your scene will look. However, this is a catch 22. Usually higher resolution textures take up more resources so you have to find the right balance for your game. Once the placeholders have been added, you can click on the placeholder. A window will pop up and you will be able to select your desired texture. Now is a good time to stop and discuss one of the main advantages of Unity. The Asset Store is a great online community that Unity developers can either acquire assets to be used in their games or develop assets that will be used by other developers. You can either get free assets from the Asset Store, or you can get better quality ones for a little bit of money. For our game, we will be using some free assets and some paid assets. If you want to use the same assets that I'm using in the book, you will need to purchase them. The next thing I like to do is locate a position on the terrain where I'll be using to create the scene objects necessary to play out the level. For this particular scene, I want to use an asset that represents an old cottage in the woods, where the hero will be awakening in the beginning of the game. I have found this nice asset in the asset store that I would like to use for my starting point of the game. The model itself does not have any interior. This fits in well because I am not planning on having any gameplay inside the shelter. It is just an eye-catching object in the scene and a starting point of reference. In order for me to place the shack in the scene, I will need to first do some adjustments to the terrain. If you notice, our terrain does not have any level areas where we can properly place the shack. We would need to use the terrain object's terrain component to make some changes. Again, select the terrain game object in the hierarchy view and use the inspector window to select the paint height tab shown already to enable the feature. This is a great feature to sample the terrain height at a particular point and apply the same height using the brush to any other region. This will level the terrain to the same height that was sampled. It's a great way to quickly level a region and place your items, if those items need to be on a level ground, like house or a shelter. The next step is to place some tree models on our terrain to create the jungle look and feel. 
To achieve this, we are going to need to select the terrain object in the scene and use the inspector window to select the tree placement feature. You will then need to select the edit trees button to add a tree model. Using the inspector window, you will need to select the tree placement tab, select edit tree, add tree feature, locate a tree prefab and you are done. Take a look at the settings and change the brush size to meet your needs. In my case, I've changed it to 9.9. .9. I've left the rest of the attributes at the default value. You can certainly change them as needed. Now, when you move your mouse in the scene view, you will notice a brush-like highlight. This is where the trees will be placed during design time. The following screenshot will display how my scene looks after I have made some of the adjustments and placements of my trees and the building. The next step of the process would be filling the level with other environment assets such as rocks, vegetation and other props to make the level come to life. The idea here is to make it interesting and at the same time functional. It is a good idea to have some sort of a sketch of your level design. This way you can have a good idea of how you will develop your level. Keep in mind that this can also be used as a means of communication with your team, the level designers and artists, providing them a direction. The following diagram is a top-down view of our intended level design. I am going to now build my level based on the layout I have. Now it is time to get creative and use your imagination to design your level. This part of the exercise is freeform. You are the designer, so you will decide how to go about placing and creating your level as long as it meets the requirements. Keep in mind the following important point. The player will be interacting with the environment or non-player characters at the designated points of interest. So make sure when you design your level, they have an easy way to access the areas where they need to get to so that they can perform the given task. One thing to notice is the limitation of the terrain as we have defined it here. When the player goes to the edge of the terrain, they will fall through. Yes, they will free fall forever. We do not want that to happen. So we will need to also incorporate some boundaries in the level design that will prevent the player from basically going overboard. It is very simple to create some restrictions and boundaries in such cases. We can use wooden fences, or we can use the actual environment to restrict the level of access by the player to the danger zones in the level. This method can be very time consuming if your level is large. Another way to solve this problem is to create four planes that will be used on each side of the terrain. The planes will have a special texture giving them an atmospheric look, but they will have colliders which will stop the player from moving forward upon contact. This is an easier method and will take less time to place in the scene. Go ahead and create a plane by choosing Game Object, 3D Object, Plane. When the plane is placed in the scene, arrange it in a way that it will be the length of the terrain. The scale of my plane is 4, 1, 4. At position, 25, 20, 25. I have also rotated the plane 90 degrees on the Z axis. You will need to also attach a collider to the plane object. The collider component will be used to detect collisions between the plane and other objects, in this case the player character, and stop the player from going through. To attach a collider, select the plane object and from the inspector window, Use the Add Component button to select Physics Box Collider. The plane now will have a box collider that will be used for collision detection by the engine. A plane object will only render on one side. Therefore, when you apply your texture to the plane, make sure that the visible side is towards the inside of the level. Once you are satisfied with the look and feel, 
you will need to duplicate it and place it on all the side edges to protect the player from falling. In the preceding screenshot, notice that the two planes on the far side are not visible. That is how the player will see the environment during gameplay. The player will collide and not be able to move forward, but they will see the skyline go far into the distance. It is time to do a test run. We can use the third person character controller in the standard assets to quickly drop our character placeholder and roam around the level to get a feel for it. Great, in this video we successfully learned about level design. Hope you enjoy watching this video. In the next video, we'll learn how to test the level. Hello again, and welcome to the next video of section one, testing the level. In the previous video, we have learned about level design. In this video, we will test out the level and look at it through the eyes of the camera. We can use the built-in third person character controller that comes in the standard assets and do a quick walkthrough of the level. If you have not imported the standard assets when you created the project, you will need to import them by selecting assets and select import package characters. In your project window, you will see a folder called Standard Assets. There is a subfolder called Character Controllers. You will need to select the third person controller prefab. And drop it somewhere on the current scene. Make sure that the third person controller, third PC, is above the terrain so it does not fall through. In the third person controller.js component, you might have to assign the idle, walk, run and jump animations. You will have to attach a rigid body component to the third PC game object. This is needed to make sure that our player character, PC, will use the built-in physics for collision detection. Go ahead and run the level and walk through the scene. Test and make sure that the PC is behaving as it's supposed to when you're navigating through the environment. When I test run my PC, I realized that I had not attached box colliders to all of the planes. I also realized that there was no collider defined for my shack. Take an inventory of such errors, and when you stop testing, make the needed corrections. Now, the character can walk, run forward, backward, and the character can jump. Great, we have successfully learned about testing the level. In the next video, we will learn how to create the main menu. Welcome to the next video of section one, creating the main menu. In the previous video, we have learned about testing the level. In this video, we're going to make a new scene that will be used as the starting point of our game. Now is a good time to create the starting point of our game. To create a new scene, you will need to select File, New Scene, and save the scene. I called my scene Main Menu. Now we have a clear canvas that we can work with to create our main menu. In the hierarchy window, right click and select UI, Panel. This will create a canvas game object and an event system game object and place them in your hierarchy window. You will notice that the panel UI object is a child of the canvas. All UI elements will be a child of a canvas. Your hierarchy should look something like in the screen. There are several key aspects that we want to make sure are set properly. These are namely on the canvas game object. Select the canvas game object and look at the inspector window. For this particular canvas, make sure that the render mode is set to screen space overlay. The next property you want to check is the UI scale mode. Change this to scale with screen size. 
This will make sure that the UI will always be scaled to the screen size of the device that the game is being run in. For best results, you will want to create multiple menus for different device types. So for now, let's go ahead and create a button that will basically load our level called Awakening. Right click on the panel object in the hierarchy window and select UI button. This will place a button on the canvas as a child to the panel object. Parent child relationships are important to consider when you are building your user interface. When you place a UI element as part of a child to another UI element, the child will be scaled and moved according to the parent scale and location. We will spend time fine tuning our menu in the future sections. Change the caption of the button to start game. It is also a good idea to name your scene object appropriately just to keep things nice and organized. I've changed the name of the button to but start game. This can be done by selecting the button object in the hierarchy window and changing the name in the inspector window. Great, we have successfully learned how to create the main menu. In the next video, we will learn how to create the game master. Welcome to the last video of section one, creating the game master. In the previous video, we have learned how to create the main menu. In this video, we're going to create a simple C-sharp script and name it GameMaster.cs. We will then create the code that will be used to handle some of the basic events we want to perform at this point, namely navigating from scene to scene. From your project window, under your scripts folder, right click and select Create C-sharp script. Name it GameMaster.cs. Double click your script to start your code editor and place this code in there. In the hierarchy window, you will need to create an empty game object. The best way to do this is by right clicking and selecting create empty. An empty game object will be created. Select it and change the name to underscore game master. We need to attach our script to the underscore game master game object in our scene. Select the game master.cs script and drag and drop it on the underscore game master. This will attach the script to the underscore game master object and make it available in the scene. The next step is creating the event call from the button. This can easily be achieved by selecting the but start game button element and from the inspector window adding a new event call on the on click component. Click the plus button to create a new event. We need to call the function we created in the GameMaster.cs script. To do so, we would need to somehow refer to it. This is done really easily. We can drag and drop the underscore GameMaster game object into the slot as indicated in the screenshot by number two. Once you place your underscore GameMaster game object in the slot, you will need to select the script from the drop down menu as indicated in the screenshot by number three. That's all there is to it. We have now connected our button click event to the code that will be responsible to load our first level. Now is a good time to save your scene and test your application. When you run the application for the first time, you will get an error. Don't be surprised. We have not done anything wrong, but there is one more step that we need to do before we can actually run our game successfully. In order to be able to load scenes in the game, you will need to make sure they are listed in the build settings. To do so, select File, Build Settings. And add the current scene to the list by selecting Add Open Scenes. 
your build settings should look like this. Load the main menu scene once more and run the application. Nice, it is working as expected. The only other item I would like to add to this in the section before we move on is the following code in the GameMaster.cs script. The single line of code in the start function will make sure that the underscore GameMaster game object does not get destroyed when we move from one scene to the next. This is important because we will be storing all of our game configuration and stats and so on in this particular game object. When you run the game now from the main menu scene, you will notice that when you load level one, the underscore game master game object comes over automatically from the main menu. This is cool. Awesome, we have successfully learned about creating the game master. This video concludes the first section of this course. In this section we establish the atmosphere and the environment that is going to be representing our RPG. We have defined our levels, the setting of each level, the objective of each level and the outcome for each level. We took the first level called Awakening and created the environment. We looked at how to use our assets and the asset store to incorporate 3D models in our scene. We also looked at how to plan the layout of the level. We introduced the third person character controller into the scene to help us visualize how the level looks from the player's perspective and help us fine tune it as needed. By the end of this section, we also developed our main menu scene and our initial game master script that will be used to glue the core of the game together. In the next section, we will start creating our player character and enhancing our game master and main menu system. So the next section, we will discuss about character design. Hi, and welcome to the second section of this course, character design. In this section, we're going to discuss the design of our RPG characters and look at some of the attributes and characteristics that we need to design and implement. Now we will see the first video of section two, character definition. In this video, we will see more about character definition. To have a meaningful and interesting RPG, the game should usually have more than one character class. We will define the following class types. Barbarians, Orcs, Magicians and Wizards, Zombies, Humans. We won't be able to implement all of the character types due to time. The demonstration of the implementation of one or two character types should give you a good ground to develop your own character classes. One of the main characters is of course the PC. Let's go ahead and concentrate on the implementation of the PC and then we can start defining and designing the Barbarian class, the Human class and perhaps the Orc class. My character models are going to be from the Asset Store. You may either download the same characters or design your own. You can also use different type of character models. The point is to implement the character based on the specifications which will be defined in this section and beyond. Nice, we have learned about character definitions. In the next video, we'll take a look at some of the attributes that our player will have in general. Hi again, and welcome to the next video of the second section, Base Character Class Attributes. In the previous video, we have learned about the character definitions. Let's start laying down the foundation we are going to need for the implementation of our character classes. The following is a list of attributes that are going to be part of the base character class. Character class name, character class description, list of attributes, strength, dexterity, endurance, intelligence, social standing, agility, alertness, vitality, willpower. The attributes you define for your characters depend on the character type, but there are going to be some similarities between all character attributes we would like to implement these similarities in a base class that will be shared with all character classes. 
The list provided is just a sample, and you can add or subtract as you see fit. Let's keep things simple. We will use only the four primary statistics for now. Strength. This is a measure of how physically strong a character is. Strength controls the maximum weight the character can carry, melee attack and or damage, and sometimes hit points. Armor and weapons might also have a strength requirement. Defense. This is a measure of how resilient a character is. Defense usually decreases taken damage by either a percentage or a fixed amount per hit. Dexterity. This is a measure of how agile a character is. Dexterity controls attack and movement speed and accuracy, as well as evading an opponent's attack. Intelligence. This is a measure of a character's problem-solving ability. Intelligence often controls a character's ability to comprehend foreign languages and their skill in magic. In some cases, intelligence controls how many skill points the character gets at level up. In some games, it controls the rate at which experience points are earned, or the amount needed to level up. This is sometimes combined with wisdom and or willpower. Health. This determines if the character is alive or dead. The attributes listed will be inherited by all character classes. Now let's put this into code. Create a new C -sharp script and name it basecharacter.cs. Open the script and place the following code in file. Awesome! In this video we have successfully learned about base character class attributes. In the next video, we'll see about character state and character model. Welcome to the next video of section 2, character states. In the previous video, we have learned about base character class attributes. In this video, we will take a look at some of the character states. States are an important part of the character design. They will also drive the kind of actions and movement you will need to create for each state. For instance, at a minimum our character will need to have these states implemented. Idle, walking, running, jumping, attacking, die. Your character may have more states defined. This is something that you as the designer of the game will need to identify and eventually implement. Each one of the states identified will need to be implemented as an animation. The person creating the character models will usually also develop the animations for the character. With the latest release of Unity 5, the Mechanim animation system was introduced which is used to create easy workflow and setup of animations on humanoid characters, retargeting of animation from one character to the next, previewing of animation clips, managing complex interactions between animations with a visual tool, and animating different body parts with different logic. You can download raw mocap data for Mechanim 1.1 from the asset store. The package contains several raw motion capture data files for your use, Beware that you might have to do some adjustments on your own. When creating your character models, it is a good idea to follow the proper bone structure setup for your characters. This will help make it easier controlling the states and animations of your characters as well as reusing your animation controller on multiple characters. This is also true if you're going to use a character from the asset store. Awesome! In this video we have successfully learned about character states. In the next video, we'll see how to build the character model. Welcome to the next video of section 2, Character Model. In the previous video, we have learned about character states. In this video, we will consider how our player character is going to look. There are several approaches that can be taken. An easy way would be to have a predefined hero where the player does not have many options and choices when it comes to customization of the character. The other way would be to provide the player with the ability to change and modify their character to an extent or fully. We are going to do something in between to get the benefit of both worlds. You may use the asset store to download predefined characters that can be used as placeholders for your game while you create your own. You can even use some of the characters that are freely available through the asset store and modify them for your needs. Once you have determined your character model, the next step is configuring it and customizing it for your game. The character model I have 
can be visually modified to represent several unique characters. You will need to study your character model carefully and understand how it is built so that you can modify it during design time and also during runtime if necessary. For instance, this is how my character model looks like in its raw format. This particular model has several visual elements attached for weapons, clothing and so on. Your model may have been configured differently. If so, you will need to create your own attachment points and instantiate the weapons and or other character related assets accordingly. Select your model and investigate the structure of your model. You will notice that there is a certain pattern and naming convention to the model hierarchy as shown in the figure above. Some models might have animations attached. To check them, you will need to select the model from the project window and select the animation tab in the inspector window to get a list of the embedded animations for the model. In the inspector window, select the animations tab shown in the figure above and notice the clip section for all animations developed for your character model like this. Notice that the animation clips have a start time and an end time. The actual character model is visually displayed at the bottom of the inspector window. Rigging your model. There might be times that you will need to rig your model to make it suitable for your game. This can be achieved by selecting your model source and from the inspector window, selecting the rig tab like this. In the rig tab, there are several options that you can apply to your model. Assuming that your character is of humanoid type, you will need to select the humanoid animation type if not already selected. The avatar definition can also be either created from the model or assigned if you have an avatar defined. Finally, you can click on the configure button to see the configuration of the rigged model. Notice from the preceding screenshot that your model has a mapping defined for its skeleton. If your model is of humanoid type and if your model structure has been named properly, the system will automatically assign the correct bones and joints. If your naming is not per unity specification, you can navigate your model structure and manually assign each point in the body, head, left hand and right hand. The muscles and settings tab will enable you to define and restrict the movement of the joints for your model. These can be very useful and practical for creating more realistic movements for your characters. You can study these topics further on your own as they will require a whole section or two to cover them. Awesome! In this video we have successfully learned about character models. In the next video we'll learn about character motion. Hi and welcome to the next video of section 2, character motion. In the previous video we have learned about character model. Let's move on to the topic. In this video we will discuss how to build the character motion. Traditionally, the motion and movement of the characters were done separately through code. With the introduction of Mechanim, you are now able to apply what is called root motion. This in return modifies the character's in-game transform based on the data in the root motion. We are going to use root motion for our characters. Root motion works with the animator controller and the animation state machine. The body transform and orientation are stored in the animation clip. This makes it easier for creating a state machine that plays the appropriate animation clip through the animator controller. In this section we will use the new animator controller to create our character states and determine the criteria for a change of states. To create an animator controller, in the project window right click and select create animator controller. Give it a name. I have called mine. CH3 underscore animator underscore controller. 
Double click the controller to open the animator window. The animator controller is a very complex tool and it will take you some time to study the different aspects and features that are available to you through it. I have marked the main sections of the animator window. There are two visible tabs, the layers tab and the parameters tab. In the layers tab you will be able to create different layers that hold your animation states and the relevant transitions from one state to the next. The parameters tab is where you define your parameters that will be accessed and modified by the animator controller as well as through your code. There are a wide range of topics that you will need to know to fully appreciate the Mechanim system. We won't be going through all of the aspects in this book, but we will touch on some of the key aspects that are needed for our game. Animation states. To create a new state, you can simply drag and drop an animation from your project window. This will name and assign the relevant animation to the state in the layer. You can also create an empty state by right clicking in the layer and selecting Create State, Empty. When a state is created, you can click on the state and observe its properties in the inspector window. Your model may or may not have animations attached to it. The whole idea of the Mechanim system is to enable character modelers to work on their models while animators can use the skeleton of a humanoid avatar to animate the character. This in turn makes it easier and better to have a set of animations applied to different types of character models. To identify the state, it is best to provide it with a unique name that can be easily recognized in the state diagram. You will need to assign a motion to it. This is the animation clip that will be playing when the state is active. The next important property would be the transitions property. A transition will determine the condition of which state will be moving to another state, if there is such a requirement. For instance, when the character is in an idle state, the condition is for the character to change its state to a walking state, to a running state, and so forth. Here you will see I have defined three different states, idle, walking, and running. You also notice in the parameters tab, I have defined some parameters. These parameters are used to determine when to move from idle to walking to running and back. The parameters are there to help you create the conditions for your state machine. To create a transition from one state to the next, select the transition arrow to get its properties and set the condition in the inspector window. The walking and running states are actually blend tree in this instance. A blend tree is used to make the transition from one animation state to the next more natural. In order for the blended motion to make sense, the motions that are blended must be of a similar nature and timing. Blend trees are used for allowing multiple animations to be blended smoothly by incorporating parts of them all to varying degrees. The amount that each of the motions contribute to the final effect is controlled using a blending parameter, which is just one of the numeric animation parameters associated with the animator controller. For instance, 
the walking state could look something like this. In our first blend tree node, we have five outputs. Walk left medium, walk left short, walk, walk right medium, walk right short. These are the animation clips that will be playing based on the value of the parameter called horizontal. In the behavior region, you will notice a few thresholds that have been set up for the parameter. These thresholds are what determine which animation is to be played. The value of the horizontal parameter is set through our C sharp code by passing in the value of the horizontal axis, which is defined in the input manager. When you select a blend tree node, your inspector window will give you the ability to add or remove the different animation states and also the parameter and the threshold of the parameter that will determine which animation will be rendered. The key to having a smooth looking blending in your animation, you will need to pay attention to your animation data. Let's take a look at our final state diagram. At this stage, I've gone ahead and implemented the state diagram for idle, walking, running, jump, attack, and walking backwards. There is also a state for when the character dies. The parameter that defines the transition from the idle state to the walking and running state is the speed parameter. If the speed value is greater than 0.1, it will transition from idle to walking. If it is greater than 0.6, it will transition from walking to running. The opposite is true for going from running to walking and from walking to idle. Notice, however, that the character can only enter the jump state from the running state. The parameter that controls this transition is the jump parameter that is a Boolean value set by pressing the spacebar button on the keyboard. There are also three unique attack states that can be entered from the idle state, and a die state that can be entered from any state. Well, because your character can die at any given time if you're not careful. Let's take a look at how we can control these parameters. Character Controller it is time to enable our character to move around the scene. This is generally handled by the character controller. The character controller will be used to handle most of the interaction the player will have with the character in the game. Create a new c -sharp script and call it charactercontroller.cs. Enter the following code in the character controller class. At the moment, the code is very basic. Let's get a listing of the code and we can start discussing the different parts of the code after the listing. In the start function, we are going to get a reference to the animator controller. We will be using the fixed updates function to perform our updates for the character movement. What is the difference between the update function and the fixed update? The update function is called every frame and is used regularly to update the moving of non-physics objects, simple timers and input processing. The update interval timer varies for the update function. Fixed update is called every physics step. The interval is consistent and is used for adjusting physics on rigid body. In the fixed update function, we get the inputs for our horizontal and vertical axis. We calculate the speed value. And set the parameters defined in the animator controller using the animator.setFloat function. These parameters are then used by the animator controller to decide which state the character is at. For instance, to go from an idle state to the walking state, the speed parameter needs to be greater than 0.1, and from walking to running, the speed parameter will need to be greater than 
The opposite is true when you want to go back from the running state to the walking state, and from the walking state to the idle state. The horizontal and vertical parameters control the movement for turning left or turning right. All these three parameters combined control which state and what animation the character is rendering. The next step is for us to enable the jump, die, and attack states. The jump states can only be entered while the character is running, and the jump boolean variable is set to true. The jump condition is set in the update function, when the spacebar is pressed by the player. This sets the variable to true and passes the variable to the animator controller. The same mechanism is used for the three attack states, attack1 underscore normal, attack2 underscore lower, and attack3 underscore destroy. These are mapped to the following keys on the keyboard, C, Z, and X respectively. Each one will set its boolean value to true and pass it into the animator controller. However, the player can only enter these three states from the idle state. We will leave it as it is for now. Finally, the die state is implemented and for now we are using the keyboard input I to test it out. The main difference between the die state and the other states so far is that the die states can be entered from any state. We are not using blend trees for these states as there is only one type of animation for the state. You will also notice that the states can only be transitioned to from the idle state. This is due to how the animations and the model were set up initially. Yours could be different. The character can get into a die state from any state, that is, your character player can die at any time in the game during whatever state he or she is at. However, for the attack and jump state, we need to be at the idle state for us to be able to transition smoothly into the proper state. You can improve these transitions and state based on the level of your animation complexity, but for now, this should do. These states are controlled through the boolean parameters defined in the animator. At this stage, you should be able to use your model to test the scene and also your character animations and states. There might be times that you will need to make some changes and or modifications to the existing animation that will make it work properly with your game and the state machine. The attack animations prepared for my character model need to be adjusted to make them loop while the character is still in that particular state. For instance, if I use the existing animation and the character state goes into attack mode, the animation will play only once. This is not what I intended to do. I am building the attack input to perform the attack while the attack key is pressed down. Changing the animation loop setting is easy. To do so, select the animation from your project window and select the edit button from the inspector window like this. You will now be in the edit mode of the animation as displayed in the screen. I have placed the inspector window side by side to illustrate the animation tab. Selecting each animation we want to modify one at a time and setting the loop time property to true. Checked. In this particular figure, you will also notice several other important properties for the animation, such as root transform rotation, mirror, curves, events, mask, and motion. We are going to use the curves property when we set out inverse kinematics for some of our animations regarding our character. This basically sets the values of predefined parameters that can be used to set or get them through Mechanim. If your animations are attached to your model and your animations and models are older, you will most likely need to make some modifications to them. For instance, one of the main properties that you might have to set for a particular animation clip would be the loop time property like this. This will make sure that the animation will loop as long as you are in the state which is running the animation. If looping is not enabled, the animation will run once and stop, even if you are still in the state representing the animation. So make sure the loop time property is set for the idle, walking, running, and attacking animations.
At the same time, not all animation clips need to be looped. For instance, the jump and die animations need to be played once, so you will need to be diligent and check all of these properties. Other animations will need to be modified to enable baking the transform into the model. For instance, the die and jump animations have the following properties checked. Root transform rotation and root transform position Y. Make sure the bake into pose property is checked. This is important to make sure the animation and the skeletal movements of the character are harmonized at the root transform position. Your animation might seem funky if these properties are not set properly. So if there is something weird going on, make sure to double check these properties. If you have not done so by now, you should attach your character controller.cs script to your player character. Awesome. In this video, we have successfully learned about character motion. Hope you enjoy watching this video. In the next video, we'll see about inverse kinematics. Welcome to the last video of section 2, Inverse Kinematics. In the previous video, we have learned about character motion. In this video, we are going to learn about inverse kinematics. Inverse kinematics, IK, are important in game programming. It is typically used to make the character's movements more realistic in the world. One of the main uses of IK is the calculation of the player's feet and how they relate to the ground they are standing on. In short, IK is used to determine the position and the rotation of joints in a character based on a given position in space. For instance, to make sure the foot of a player is landing properly on the terrain it is walking on. Unity has a built-in IK system that can be used to do some basic calculation in this regard. Let's go ahead and implement the foot IK for our character. There are a few things that you will need to set up before we can enable IK for our humanoid character. The first thing to do is check your layer in the animator controller and use the engine icon to enter the settings window. Make sure that IK pass is checked like this. You will also need to provide a mask if you have not done so already. The mask is used to dictate which parts of the skeleton are affected by the IK. Once you have set up this, the fun begins. We need to create a C-sharp script that will handle our IK. Create a C-sharp script and call it ikhandle.cs. Type this code into the script. This script is a bit involved. In order for the IK to work properly, we need important points in space. One of these points is the position of the target in space that we want our foot to move to, and the second point in space is the hint. These two points in space are used to control the movement and translations of the skeleton for a particular joint to be made in order to successfully complete the IK for the target position. The variables left foot position and right foot position are used to represent the target position for the left and right foot during runtime. Left foot rotation and right foot rotation is used to store the rotation of the left and right foot. We also need two variables to actually reference our left and right foot in the model. These are done by the left foot and right foot variables. Some of these variables are initialized in the start function. Specifically speaking, we get a reference to the left and right foot from the animator controller bone structure defined for humanoids. In the update function, we use physics.raycast to perform some raycasting to determine the position of our left and right foot. This data is then used and stored in the variables left foot position and right foot position variables with their equivalent rotation data in the left foot rotation and right foot rotation variables. The actual IK animation is applied in the onAnimatorIK function. The left foot weight and right foot weight variables are used to get the parameter values set for the left foot 
and right foot in the animator controller through the animation clip curve function. The key here is to properly define the curve of the animation clip that will be used to drive the weight of the IK. This will show you the curve of the idle state. Both feet are on the ground, therefore the value is set to 1. For your walking and running clips, your curve will be different. Finally, the set IK position weight and set IK position functions are used to properly adjust the position and rotation of the feet relative to the ground. Notice that this is performed for each foot separately. Attach the ikhandle.cs script to your character and do a test run. Notice the difference of your character and the way it is interacting with the floor or the terrain you have set up. Awesome! We have successfully learned about inverse kinematics. This video concludes the second section of this course. We covered a lot of topics in this section. We discussed the different character definitions we are going to be using for our game, looked at the base character class attributes that will be shared by all of our characters, created the base character class to be used later in the game, discussed the primary states our character will have in the game, and how to implement them using the animator controller. We looked at how to rig our character model to be prepared for the mechanism system, and how to use the mechanism system to create animation and state diagrams that will determine how the character is behaving during gameplay. Then we implemented our initial character controller script that handles the state of our character. This gave us the opportunity to look at the blend trees and transition from one state to the next using parameters. Looked at how to modify animation clips if there is a need for it. Finally, looked at inverse kinematics that will help our character behave more realistically in the game environment. By the end of the section, you should have a good grasp of all the different components that are working together to make your character look, behave, and move in the game environment. In the next section, we will be introducing non-character behaviours. So the next section we will discuss about player character and non-player character design. Hi, and welcome to the next section, player character and non-player character design. In the previous section, we covered a wide range of topics to prepare our character model for the game. In this section, we will expand on the customization of the player character and non-player characters, NPCs. Then we will be looking at the PC and NPC interaction throughout this section. The first video of this section that deals with customizing the player character. In this video, we are going to learn about customizable parts, user interface, check code for character customization, and see how to preserve our character state. By the end of this video, we will have a quick recap to recollect what we learned until now. We will begin by creating a new scene and name it Character Customization. You know how to create a new scene. You just have to click on File and create a new scene like this. You can rename it by using the Save As option. But I've already renamed the scene so I won't change it. Let's create a cube prefab and set it to the origin. For that, you need to go to Game Object, then 3D Object and click on Cube. So this is a cube prefab. Now, scale it to 5, 0 0.1, 5. Let's rename it as Base. This will be the platform that our character model stands on while the player customizes his or her character before gameplay. Now, drag and drop the FBX file representing your character model into the scene view. The next few steps will entirely depend on your model hierarchy and structure as designed by the modeler. To illustrate the point, I have placed the same model in the scene twice. The one on the left is the model that has been configured to display only the basics. Let me show you how to do it. Go to Character Customization and save it as Custom. So this is my scene where you can see that I have added a base. You can change the colour or texture as you want. The model on the right is the model in its original state as shown in the following screenshot. Notice that this particular model I am using has everything attached. 
These include the different types of weapons, shoes, helmets and armour. If you want to convert the model on the left to the model on the right, then you can just disable a few options. Select barbarian underscore boot underscore zero one underscore L zero D zero and uncheck it. You can see that the shoes are disabled. You can repeat the process for cloth and disable it and see that things are disappearing. Based on my model, I can customize a few things on my 3D model. I can customize the shoulder pads, I can customize the body type, I can customize the weapons and armor it has, I can customize the helmet and shoes, and finally, I can also customize the skin texture to give it different looks. Let's get a listing of all the different customizable items we have for our character. Shoulder shields, there are four types. Body type, there are three body types. Skinny, buff, and chubby. Armor, knee pad, leg plate. Shields, boots, there are two types of boots. Helmet, there are four types of helmets. Weapons, there are 13 different types of weapons. Skins, there are 13 different types of skins. Let's go to user interface. So, this is the base where you can place the character. You need to drag and drop it from here and make all the changes. For now, to design the UI, we will need to create a canvas game object. This is done by right clicking in the hierarchy view and selecting create UI canvas. This will place a canvas game object and an event system game object in the hierarchy view. I'm going to use a panel to group the customizable items. For the moment, I will be using checkboxes for some items and scroll bars for the weapons and skin texture. Final UI customization would look something like this. These UI elements will need to be integrated with event handlers that will perform the necessary actions for enabling or disabling certain parts of the character model. For instance, using the UI I can select shoulder pad 4, buff body type, Move the scroll bar until the hammer weapon shows up. Select the second helmet checkbox and selecting shield 1 and boot 2. We need a way to refer to each one of the meshes representing the different types of customizable objects on the model. This will be done through a C sharp script. The script will need to keep track of all the parts we are going to be managing for customization. Things don't happen automatically. So we need to create some C-sharp code that will handle the customization of our character model. The script we create here will handle the UI events that will drive the enabling and disabling of different parts of the model mesh. Create a new C-sharp script and call it characterCustomization.cs. This script will be attached to the base game object in the scene. This is the script for character customization. Models are of type game object, with the exception of the player underscore skin variable, which is an array of material data type. The array is used to store the different types of texture created for the character model. There are a few functions defined that are called by the UI event handler. These functions are set shoulder pad toggle ID set body type toggle ID, set knee pad toggle ID, and many more. All of the functions take a parameter that identifies which specific type it should enable or disable. A big note here, you can also use the system we just built to create all of the different variations of your non-character player models and store them as prefabs. This will save you so much time and effort in creating your characters representing different barbarians. Now that we have spent the time to customize our character, we need to preserve our character and use it in our game. In Unity, there is a function called Don't Destroy on Load. This is a great function that can be utilized at this time. What does it do? It keeps the specified game object in memory going from one scene to the next. We can use these mechanisms for now. Eventually though, 
you will want to create a system that can save and load your user data. Go ahead and create a new c -sharp script and call it do not destroy.cs. This is the script attached. After you create the script, go ahead and attach it to your character model prefab in the scene. Not bad. Let's do a quick recap of what we have done so far. By now, you should have three scenes that are functional. We have our scene that represents the main menu. We have our scene that represents our initial level. And we just created a scene that is used for character customization. Here is the flow of our game thus far. We start the game, see the main menu, select the start game button to enter the character customization scene, do our customization, and when we click the save button, we load level one. For this to work, we've created the following c -sharp scripts. GameMaster.cs, used as the main script to keep track of our game state. CharacterCustomization.cs, used exclusively for customizing our character. Do not destroy.cs used to save the state of a given object. CharacterController.cs used to control the motion of our character. IKHandle.cs used to implement inverse kinematics for the foot. When you combine all of this together, you now have a good framework and flow that can be extended and improved as we go along. In this video, we have learned how to customize our character player in RPG. In the next video, we will focus on the non-player characters. Hello and welcome to the next video of this section, non-player characters. In the previous video, we looked at customization process used for the model characters. In this video, we are going to take a look at non-player character basics. Then we will move on to setting up the non-player character, NPC animator controller and NPC attack. By the end of this video, we will go through NPC AI in detail. Let's start with our barbarians. Using the tools we have just developed, you can make your adjustments and when satisfied with your model, drag and drop the game object representing your character player into the prefabs folder. This will create a copy of the instance of the game object as you see it and save it into a prefab. I have created these two prefabs and stored in the prefab folder. We not only create a scene that allows us to customize our in-game player character, we have also created a tool that can help us customize our own character models quickly for use in the game. We are going to be using the newly created prefabs to implement our non-player characters. Since there are some similarities in the character models, we can reuse some of the assets we have created so far. We have used our character customization tool to create and save our non-player character. Hence, we are okay with the modeling part. One of the main difficulties for implementing an NPC is the ability to give it realistic intelligence. This can be achieved easily by identifying and implementing several key areas for our NPCs. There are a few new components we would need to attach to our NPCs. Using the prefab we have saved, we will need to add the following components. New Sphere Collider. This will be used to implement the range of sights for our NPC. I made a component attached, but we will need to create a new animated controller to capture new states for the NPC. We would also need to add a Nav Mesh Agent component. We are going to use the built-in navigation and pathfinding system for our NPC. To add the Sphere Collider, you will need to select the prefab defined for the NPC and in the inspector window, select Add Component, Physics, Sphere Collider. This will attach a Sphere Collider to our prefab. Let's change its center to 0, 1.1, 0. Repeat the same procedure for the other character and save it. Next, we need to add the Nav Mesh Agent. Again, from the inspector window, select Add Component, Navigation, Nav Mesh Agent. Okay, so now we have set up our main built-in components. 
that are going to be used for the NPC. Repeat this for other characters too. Since our prefab is an instance of our player character, we will need to remove some of the script components that have been carried over. If your NPC prefab contains any scripts attached to it, go ahead and remove them now. Make sure you also change the tag property to untagged if you have not done so already. Here, we will include both the existing components, including the scripts we have brought over from the player character, and the newly added components that will be used for the NPC. The next step is to set up our nav mesh. To create a nav mesh, we need to get into the navigation window. To do so, select Window. Navigation. In order for the nav mesh to work properly, we will need to mark all game objects in the scene as navigation static. This will create a nav mesh based on the static objects in the scene, that is, game objects that are not going to be moving throughout the lifespan of the scene. In your active scene, select the game objects that are going to be set as navigation static, as shown, and use the static drop down menu as shown and select the navigation static option. If your game object is a parent game object with children, Unity will ask if you want to apply the property change to all children. Notice that I have placed all of my environment game objects under a game object called environment. This way, if I have many static objects, I can apply the property change to the parent and the children will automatically inherit the change as well. But make sure everything in the group will be static. Once this is complete, we need to go back to the navigation window and make some adjustments. In the Navigation tab, select Terrains and make sure it is set to Navigation Static and the Navigation Area is set to Walkable. In the Bake tab, change the Agent Radius to 0.3 and Agent Height to 1. This will give the NPC more freedom to pass through tight corners. When you are ready, you can select the Bake button at the bottom of the Navigation window. Unity will take some time to generate the nav mesh for your scene. This will depend on the complexity of your level. If all is done correctly, you will see something similar to this. The blue areas you see are all the regions that the NPC can actually navigate to. We now need to create the animator controller, AC, for our NPC. The animator controller will use input from the mesh agent to control and change the state of our NPC. We also need to define a few parameters for our NPC, AC. These are going to be angular speed, will be used for directional movement, speed, 
will be used to determine how fast the NPC will be moving. Attack will be used to determine if it needs to attack. Attack weight used to determine damage of the attack. Player in sight will be used to determine if the PC is in sight. Go ahead and create a new animator controller in your project and name it NPC underscore animator underscore controller. Open the animator window. Create a new blend tree by right clicking in the animator window and selecting create state from new blend tree. The blend tree is named as NPC underscore locomotion. Double click it so that you can edit the blend tree. From the inspector window, change the blend type to 2D freeform Cartesian. The X axis will be represented by the angular speed and the Y axis will be represented by the speed parameters. The blend tree is going to hold all of the different locomotion animation states. These are going to be the idle, walking and running states. I have set up 11 different animation states for the locomotion of my NPC. Once you include all of the animation states in the blend tree, you will need to compute the positions of your animations. An easy way to do this is to select the Compute Positions drop down menu and select the Angular Speed and Speed. This will place the animation position based on the root motion as illustrated in the following screenshot. You can use your mouse to drag the red points on the diagram to preview your animation states in action. In order to implement our attack mode, we will need to create a new layer in the animator controller. Go ahead and create a new layer and call it NPC attack. This layer will be responsible for animating our character when we enter attack mode. We need to create a new mask for the layer. The mask will be used to determine which part of the humanoid body will be affected by the layer animation. To create a mask, right click in your project window and select Create, Avatar Mask. Name the new mask NPC Attack. Use the inspector window to disable the body parts that we don't want to be affected by the layer animation. Your layer setup should look like this. Make sure you change the weight property to 1. the mask property assigned to the avatar mask we created and also that the IK property is checked. Now we are ready to create our attack state machine. Right click in the animator window and select create state, empty. Drag and drop your attack animations. The empty state is used to have a nice transition between the main layer and back. After you have dropped your attack animations into the animator, you will need to connect them using the transition conditions. I have added three more parameters to the parameter list named attack1, attack2 and attack3. These parameters in connection with the attack parameter will determine which attack state our NPC will transition to. Finally, you want to assign the new NPC animator controller to the NPC prefab. Now it is time to give some intelligence to our NPCs. One of the scripts we will need to create is the ability for the NPC to detect the player. This script will be called NPCSight.cs. The script will be used to detect if the player is in sight, calculate the field of view for the NPC, and calculate the path from the NPC to the player character. So here is the source code. Okay. So let's actually take a look and see what this code is trying to do. In the awake function, we are initializing our variables that will be used in the script. We have a reference to the nav mesh agent, the sphere collider, and the animator components attached to the NPC. These are stored in the nav, call, 
and anim variables, respectively. We also need to get a reference to the player and the player animator component. This is done through the player variable. We are also setting the player in sight variable to false by default. The update function is not performing anything major at this point. It is just checking to see if the player character is in sight, and if so, it makes sure the NPC is orienting itself to look at the player. Most of the meat of our code is in the onTriggerStay function. The first thing we need to do is make sure the object that has entered our collider is the player object. This is done by checking the tag attribute on the other collider. If the player is within our collider, then we go ahead and calculate the direction, the distance, and the angle of the player relative to the NPC. Then, if the angle is smaller than the field of view angle variable, we can use ray casting to determine if we can hit the player. If that is the case, the player is in NPC sight. Once we have established that the player is in range and that we are facing the player, we need to make the NPC find its way to the player. This is where the nav mesh and the nav mesh agents come into play. The calculate path length is a function that takes the position of the player and using the mesh data calculates the best path to navigate from the NPC's location to the player's location. However, there's one more additional calculation we are performing, and that is we are calculating the length of the path between the two points. This length calculation will be used in the future to perform the following. If the length of the path is larger than a threshold we have set, then we won't make the NPC attack. If it is, then we can make the NPC move towards the player to engage in battle. In the last function, on trigger exit, we set the player in sight variable to false. This will stop the NPC from pursuing the player. Go ahead and attach the script to the NPC prefab if you have not done so already and run the application to test it out. If all things are good, then you will be able to move the player character around the level and once the player character enters the NPC's field of view, the NPC will start moving toward the player and when close enough, it will attack. At this point, your NPC should have the following components attached to its prefab. Animator, rigid body, capsule and sphere colliders, nav mesh agent, NPC underscore movement script. I have made a few changes in the rigid bodies and checked the kinematics. Also, increase the speed auto braking is also checked. Now, they are moving towards me as shown. We can see the difference in their speeds as we've set different speeds for each character. In this video, we defined the non-player character's basics and NPC AI. Great! In the next video, we are going to cover PC and NPC interaction. Hi again. Welcome to the last video of this section, PC and NPC interaction. In the previous video, we learned about the non-player characters. In this video, we are going to keep a track of the hit points when the NPC is attacking and we will implement attack mechanism for the characters. Then, we will create a new character and summarize the PC and NPC interactions. Let's start by implementing the hit for the NPC. Our NPC detects the player character based on the code we just created in the previous section. When the player character is in sight, the NPC will find the shortest path to the player character and, at a given range, it will attack the player character. So we have the movement and animation mechanics completed. The next objective is to keep track of the hit points when the NPC is attacking. There are a few adjustments we need to make in the NPC underscore animator underscore controller. Open the animator window and select the NPC underscore attack layer. Double click on the attack one state or the attack states you have defined in your state machine. This will open the related animation in the inspector window. In the inspector window, scroll down to the curve section. We are going to create a new curve by selecting the plus sign under the curve section. 
we are also going to create a new parameter called attack1c to represent the value of the curve. This parameter should be of type float. The curve displayed here will be based on your animation. I have marked the important parts of the interface you will need to work with to configure the curve of an animation. The first step would be to actually preview your animation and get a feeling for it. The next step for my particular animation sequence was determining when the right arm of the model starts moving along and I set a marker in the curve. I make another marker a bit more into the animation where the right arm has crossed a good deal of the right side to the left side. These markers will indicate a hit point during the animation when the NPC is in attack mode. Okay, so why do we do this? Simple. This will help us only generate a hit based on the curve of the animation. This way, we don't hit the player and reduce the health of the player while the weapon is away from the player's body. Next, we need to update our NPC's movement.cs code to program the NPC attack. Here is the updated code. The new addition to the code checks to see if the player is in sight, and if that is the case, we check to see if we are in range to be able to attack. If that is the case, we can enter the attack mode. If we are in the attack mode, the attack animation is played. In the code we check to get the value of the newly created parameter called attack1c, and if it happens to be of value 1.0f, then we go ahead and reduce the health of the player character. If the player dies while the NPC is attacking, it will stop attacking and go back into the idle state. Okay, you might be wondering how we get the ability to get the information from the player character. This is because we need to make some more additional c -sharp scripts. Let's go ahead and do so now. Create the following c -sharp scripts. PC.CS This is going to be our player character class, which inherits from the base character class we have defined previously. PlayerAgent.cs This is going to be used to store the PC data and also inherit mono behavior. NPC.cs This is going to be our non-player character class, which inherits from the base character class as well. NPC underscore Agent.cs Is going to be used to store the NPC data and also inherit mono behavior. I have made some modifications to the base character.cs script to make it more accessible through the editor. Here is the new listing. I have gone ahead and made the class and the fields serializable. Let's take a look at the listings for the PC.CS. Nothing much going on there at this point. Now let's take a look at the PlayerAgent.CS. In the PlayerAgent code, we are initializing some default values for our PC data in the awake function. Since the class has been serialized, we can actually see the data during runtime for debugging purposes. In the update function, we check to see if the health of our PC is less than 0.0f. If it is, then this indicates the player has died, which we then use the character controller component we have created to set the die property to true. The character controller then will use the new value and communicate with the animator controller for the player character to get into the die state. Notice that our NPC movement.cs script is accessing the exact same PC data through the reference we have created in the script. You will need to attach the player agent.cs script to your player character in the scene. You can see the additions we have done to the scripts and how they look during runtime. In this video, we created new scripts to make interaction between the NPC and the player character possible. In this section, we learned how to customize your player character. 
how to preserve the state of our player character after customization for gameplay, and looked at the non-player characters. We created the initial NPC AI script to detect and determine if the player is close enough for it to make a move and or attack. Finally, we completed the attack mechanism for the PC and the NPC characters. In the next section, we will be enhancing the game master and game mechanics to handle the game settings and scene management. Hey guys, welcome to the new section, Game Master and Game Mechanics. In this section, we will be creating Game Master to manage our game with RPG. We will also learn how to improvise the Game Master. Then, we will see how to manage the data for the player and update the UI controller. By the end of this section, we will test the game to check if everything is working fine. We will now move on to the first video of this section, the Game Master. In this video, we are going to take a look at game settings and audio management, use GameMaster.cs for our game and finally manage different scenes for the game. Let's start with the first concept that is Game Master. Even though we created a GameMaster.cs script, we have not really utilized it to manage our game. We created bits and pieces of our game assets and used them to perform quick testing. In this chapter, we will start looking at how to create a better game manager for our RPG. There are a few things that I want the GameMaster.cs to perform. These are having a reference to the UI controller for each particular scene, having a reference to the player character in the scene, having a reference to the non-player character in the scene, having a reference to the audio source for control. There should always be one instance of the Game Master class available. As we create our Game Master, we will add or subtract some of the elements as we see fit. Let's start by integrating the user interface with the Game Master. Open up your main menu scene. I added a few UI elements here. There is a button that is a placeholder for the game settings indicated by the star button. When this button is pressed, you will get a panel that will give you the ability to control the master volume of the game. Let's have a look at the hierarchy window for the main menu scene. User controller is the game object that you need to create and make sure to drag and drop it in the prefab panel. I will show you the code in later stage. Next, go to Canvas. Now we need to have a panel on which you have Start Game button. Within the panel, we have But Start Game and But Setting. Now, within the canvas, we need another canvas like this, named as Canvas Setting. Add Panel Setting and Text Setting in the Canvas Setting. We want the slider under Panel Setting. So, Drag and drop it to canvas. Also, shift text main volume under panel setting. Create an empty game object and name it UI controller. We now need to create a UI controller script that will handle the user interaction. Create a new C sharp script and name it UI controller.cs. Note that the scripts will be updated and modified as we progress. Here is a listing of the UI controller. Currently, we have just a few functions defined. Display settings and main volume. The functions are really simple. They are referencing the UI components needed to display the settings panel and also to retrieve the value of the volume control slider. The information is then passed to the gamemaster.cs script for further processing. We need to make several changes to the GameMaster.cs script. Here is the code. We have to modify this code a bit. Add public static Game Master instance here. This code needs a bit of explanation. The first and most important concept to take away is the concept of singleton. This is done by first defining a static variable, which will be used to hold our Game Master instance. 
In the awake function, we are checking to see if the instance variable has been initialized. It sets the instance variable once. The next check ensures that we are always having one instance. In other words, if the game master object gets instantiated a second time by mistake, it will destroy it. The last line of code, don't destroy on load, will ensure that the game object does not get destroyed when we move from one scene to the next. In the start function, we are checking to see if there is a UI controller present, and if one exists, we are getting a reference to it. Once we have a reference to the UI controller, we make sure that the settings panel by default is disabled, hidden. The master volume function gets called from the UI controller.cs script, which then passes the actual value from the slider defined to control the volume of the background music. For the next item, I want to make it have the game master control loading the different scenes for the game. Let's look at how the GameMaster.cs will look like with the new addition of scene management. We've already discussed what the awake function is doing. Let's take a look at the next important function. On level was loaded. The on level was loaded function is called by Unity after the scene had been loaded. We're using this function in the game master script to perform a few tasks. We check to see if we are in the character customization scene to get reference to the base game object in the scene, where the player can customize the PC before they start. If we are in any other scene, then we want to get a reference to the player character, and also its starting position, if there is one. We then use the determine level function to determine the level we are currently on to make some more configuration. The two functions currently implemented for starting the game and loading the levels are handled by the start game function and the load level function. The scene name class is designed to make it easier to refer to the scene names in the C-sharp code. This makes it easier to change the actual scene name within the project, but have a consistent call name in the code. This is all good so far, but we can try to make it better. In this video, we learned how to create the Game Master. Amazing! In the next video, we will see how to enhance the Game Master. Hello guys, welcome to the next video of this section, Improving Game Master. In the previous video, we looked at Game Master and enhanced the Game Master class to handle game settings. In this video, we are going to take a look at the structure of the code. We will then talk about the level controller, as well as the audio controller. The code we have so far works, but it is not very clean. Let's go ahead and structure the code a little better. Let's go ahead and create a new script called levelcontroller.cs. This new script will be handling the logic for our level management. Here is a listing of levelcontroller.cs. So what I've done is basically move all of the code that deals with level management into levelcontroller.cs. Our game master drives the level controller class. We will see this a bit later. The next code cleanup I want to do is for the audio. Let's create a new script called audiocontroller.cs. Here is the code for the new script. The code is pretty straightforward. Now, let's take a look at what our GameMaster.cs looks like. As you can see, the code is easier to read, and also, it is better structured. The Game Master is using the controllers for performing each specific task. This also makes it easier to maintain code for different tasks within our game. For instance, all of the audio related code can now be implemented in the controller, and so on. In this video, we have improved our game master and the internal structure for our code. In the next video, we will look at data management for the player. Hi, let's check out the next video. Player Data Management In the previous video, we learned how to enhance Game Master. In this video, we are going to check how to improve the scripts to save the selected data in our PC object. Then, 
we will be modifying PC scripts. Finally, we will detect which option the player has selected through the character customization UI. Here, we will enhance our PC.CS and character customization.CS scripts to actually save the selected data in our PC object. To do this, we need to modify our PC.CS code. Here is the new code listing. We define several enumeration types that describe the different parts of the player's character's customization. There are several advantages in using enumeration in our code, a few of them being named constants. The name describes what they're for, type safety, and easier to change the value of the enumeration without having to check a hundred different places within your code. As stated in the previous section, the character customization code is heavily related to your character model and how you have rigged up your character model to be used in the game. The events that drive the character customization are attached to the base prefab, which has the character customization.cs script as a component. The character customization.cs script is listed here. In the code, what we have done is added a new variable of type PC named PC underscore CC. The PC class is the player character class we defined and enhanced to contain the data for our player character. The next logic we need to implement is to detect which option the player has selected through the character customization UI and appropriately set the data in the PC object. The implementation concept is the same for all the different parts of the player character that can be customized. I have listed the syntax for set body type. This code is for the customization of the body type of the player character. The first thing it tries to do is to pass and convert the value passed to the function by the UI component. Next, it sets the select body type variable in the PC object. If for some reason the value passed does not exist in the enumeration, we will assign the default value to the selected body type variable. There are also debug statements to give you feedback about the current value. In this video, we have learned how to manage the data for our player. In the next video, we will be making some changes to the UI controller. Hello guys, we are now in the fourth video, changes to UI controller. In the previous video, we looked at the actual data representing the customization of our player. In this video, we will be making changes to the UI controller. We will then update load level and game master to make sure that the character customization setup is properly modified. The UI controller will also need to be updated now to make the necessary changes. This will make sure that Game Master is updated with the proper player character data. Let's go ahead and test the code. In this video, we made appropriate changes in the UI controller so as to update character customization. In the next video, we will have a test run of the game. Hey. Welcome to the last video of this section, testing. In the previous video, we learned how to update the UI controller. In this video, we will be checking if all the game objects have been added to the scene. Then, we will be loading the character customization scene. And finally, we will have all the data gathered for the game. Starting from the main menu scene, let's make sure that you have the following game objects in the scene such as UI controller and game master. The UI controller game object should have UI controller attached and game master should have the following components attached, such as game master and an audio source component that will be used for the background music. Have the game master game object selected in the hierarchy window. Run the game. Select the start game button. This will load the character customization scene. The underscore game master game object should still be selected. If not, go ahead and select it from the hierarchy window. Do some of the character customization and click on the save button. 
The first level should have been loaded with your character and the customization you have made to your character in the previous step. So visually, your character has retained all of the customization you have done. And from a data point of view, when you look at the game master game object in the inspector window, you will notice that the data has been saved properly as shown. In this video, we performed a test for the game to check all the data that is saved. In this section, we enhanced the Game Master class to handle the game settings and also improved our Game Master and the internal structure for our code. We then saw how to handle the player character data and made some modifications to the existing UI controller. By the end of this section, we had a test run of the game to double check that everything worked as designed and implemented. Superb! In the next section, we are going to start building our inventory system. And yes, that is going to involve more code. Hi, we are now in the new section, Inventory System. In this section, we will be creating a simple inventory system and we'll be looking at the inventory interface. Then, we will be integrating the UI with the actual inventory system. And finally, We'll discuss the inventory items and the player character. Now we move on to the first video of this section that deals with inventory system. In this video, we're going to take a look at weighted inventory. We are then going to discuss determining item types by the end of this video. To begin with, we're going to be leaning towards implementing what is called the weighted inventory. In this type of inventory system, each item or piece of equipment is assigned a numerical value that represents the weight of the item. This in turn is used to determine how much inventory the player can carry at any given time during gameplay. This makes sense for our RPG, if you think about it. Consider the following as an example. Assume you are a hiker who wants to climb Mount Ararat. The climb itself is going to require some time and during the journey you will need to carry with you the necessary equipment to be able to complete the journey. Realistically, there are several crucial items that you as the hiker will need to carry with you. Here is a simplified list. Clothing, tents, sleeping bags, boots, icebreakers, food, light source, personal items. Each one of the categories listed has a specific weight associated to it in real life. Therefore, when you are planning your hike, you will need to plan ahead and see how you can meet your climbing needs, while in the meantime also reducing the number of items and total weight of the items you will need to carry on your back during the journey. The actual logistics are a little more involved, but you get the picture. It is no different in our RPG. The player character can only carry certain number of items and or equipment with them for their journey. For instance, the player character cannot be carrying 20 different types of weapons at any given time. It would be just impossible, realistically speaking. So it would be a nice touch to put in some realism in the gameplay. For starters, we are going to concentrate on some of the basic items such as weapons, armor and clothing. On top of this, we can also add the following. Health packets, potions and collectibles. We are going to create three new scripts named baseitem.cs, inventoryitem.cs, and inventorysystem.cs. The baseitem class will hold the generic properties for all items, just like the base character class we defined previously. The inventory item class will inherit the base item class and define the item type. Here is a listing of baseitem.cs. The main idea in the code is the item category. At the moment, I have kept it to only five different types of categories that the inventory would keep track of. A category could have multiple item types. For instance, there are different types of weapons such as swords, hammers and spears. Here is the listing of inventoryitem.cs. This code implements more properties or attributes for the items to be used in the inventory. For now, Let's just keep it the way it is. We can always change it in the future. 
The next important script is the actual script that will be used to manage the inventory. There are many ways to implement the logic for the inventory system. Again, keeping things simple, the current script will have five list data types of type inventory item. One for each item category. Here is the listing of inventory system.cs. We won't have direct access to the list that will be used to contain the inventory items. For now, we've implemented two functions, add item and delete item, which will handle the two basic features of the inventory, adding an item to it and removing an item from it. These two functions will take an inventory item object and, based on the item category, be added or removed from the appropriate list within the inventory. The basics are in place. Now we will need to integrate this with the game master script. To do so, we will need to create a new variable of type inventory system named inventory and initialized in the awake function of the game master script. Notice that we are actually creating an inventory item and inserting it into the inventory system for testing purposes. Another great feature is the fact that you can see the inventory system within the designer in the inspector window since we have serialized the classes and the fields. This screenshot displays the inventory system as seen in the inspector window when you select the game master object. When you run the game to test it you will see this update. Notice how the data reflects appropriately in the inventory system as expected. The clothing list has now increased its size to 1 and the inventory item within the list is properly stored and displayed for testing and debugging. We have one clothing item named testing. With the given description and a strength of 0.5 and weight of 0.2. You can see that I have added some skywalks to base along with plane that won't allow my character to move out of the terrain shown. So far, so good. In this video, we saw the scripts that will help in designing and developing our inventory. In the next video, we will actually create the items that will be used to visually represent our inventory items. Hi, and welcome to the second video of this section, Creating Inventory Item. In the previous video, we saw the overview of the inventory system. In this video, we will be creating the prefab. We will also add inventory item agent, and then we will look at the inventory items defined as prefabs. We will be creating one item type from each item category to keep things simple. This section will really be again highly dependent on how you have modeled your character models. You will need to navigate down your model's hierarchy and extract the mesh for the specific armor or weapon or anything else that you are going to use for the inventory. If you recall from the character customization scene, we have already gone through the model and identified the parts we want to have the player be able to enable or disable based on the selection they make through the interface. If you have not done so already, go ahead and create a folder in your project window named prefabs. Within this folder, go ahead and create a new folder and name it inventory items, and then a subfolder named shoulder pads. To create a prefab, you simply need to take an existing game object that is present in the scene window and drag it into the project window. To keep things organized, we will be using the structure defined in the previous paragraph. So you will need to navigate to the shoulder pads folder in the project window and then perform the following. Simply drag one of the shoulder pad meshes from your model and drop it into the shoulder pads folder. Observe, when you create a prefab, the prefab will be an exact copy of the game object in the active scene. In this case, my mesh is disabled in the scene. Therefore, when I create a prefab of the mesh, it will also be disabled. Since it is disabled, when you drag the newly created prefab into the scene as a new game object, it will be invisible. You will need to enable it. We need a means to interact with our inventory items. In order to do this, 
we will need to create a new script coded in the inventory item agent script that will handle our interaction with the inventory items during gameplay. At the moment, the script will just enable us to interact with the inventory item object through the IDE. Very simply, in order for us to be able to interact with the game object, we would need to use a script that inherits mono behavior. Go ahead and attach this script to your prefab. Now you can easily set up your inventory items visually. In the preceding screenshot, you can see that we have created a game object from the prefab and using the inventory item agent component. We have access to the properties of the inventory item object. Utilizing this concept, you can now create your prefabs for the different types of inventory items. If you are applying your changes in the scene window, make sure you apply them to the original prefab so that it keeps it in memory. Caution, when you apply changes to a prefab, all instances of the prefab get updated with the new attributes. At the moment, we have implemented an easy way to define our inventory items, but we still need to implement use interaction with the items. The logic for the interaction will be implemented in the inventory item agent script. First, we need to identify who we are colliding with. In this case, we want to make sure it is the player that is going to collect the item. Second, we need to store the data into the game master and also remove the game object from the active scene. The last two parts will be handled by the game master, as you will see. Here is the new code listing for inventory item agent. I have created a new function in the inventory item.cs script called copy inventory item. This function is used to make a copy of one inventory item object into another one. Here is the code for the newly added function in the inventory item class. We already saw how to add an item to the inventory using the game master. However, we need to add a new function that would handle the destruction of game objects in our game. This is done by the RPG destroy function. You cannot use destroy, destroy immediate, or destroy object since they are part of all game objects in Unity. Therefore, be cautious with your naming convention within your own classes. Here is the listing of the new function. One final component that needs to be added to your prefabs representing the inventory items is a collider. I used a box collider to keep things simple. A collider can be added by selecting Add Component, Physics, Box Collider from the Inspector window. Here we will demonstrate some of the inventory item prefabs I've created for demonstration. The key for all of this to work is to make sure that your prefabs have the inventory item agent script as well as a collider component attached to the prefabs. Then you will need to provide the inventory item data through the IDE, uniquely identifying each one. This table lists the data for each inventory item defined. The data again is arbitrary. You can decide what best suits your game and game design. In this video, we have created the inventory system. Amazing! In the next video, we will talk about the inventory interface. Hello, let's start with the next video, inventory interface. In the previous video, we saw how to create the inventory system. In this video, we are going to take a look at creating the inventory UI framework. We will also be designing a dynamic item viewer by adding elements to panel item and scroll view. Later, we will be building the final inventory item UI. 
It is now time to think about how we are going to visualize our inventory during gameplay. Creating a user interface for any game is a challenging task. Let's see how we can design a simple user interface to enable the player with the basics of interacting with the inventory system. Here is a list of minimum features that the player should be able to perform. Display the inventory at any time during gameplay. Navigate based on category. See what items are listed under each category. Be able to remove an item from the inventory. Be able to consume an item from the inventory. See what inventory items are already in use by the player. Let's start by identifying the categories that will need to be displayed. The categories are defined as an enum named item category in the base item class. We have the following, weapons, armor, clothing, health, and potions. This diagram is a concept I am leaning towards for the implementation of the inventory interface. The interface can be constructed by utilizing the following UI elements, buttons, panels, text, images. Each category will have a button, and there will be one main panel that will contain the list of items per category, as illustrated in the preceding diagram. Each item will be contained in its own panel that will contain an image of the inventory item, the item description, and two buttons that can be used to add or remove the item from the inventory system. Let's start by first implementing the initial framework for our inventory system graphical interface. In the main scene of your project, go ahead and create a new canvas game object if you have not done so already. To do so, right click on the hierarchy window and select UI panel. This will automatically create a canvas game object and a panel UI element as a child to the canvas. Rename this panel panel inventory. This will be the main panel that will contain everything else. Now, let's go ahead and start building the buttons that will represent our main categories. Similarly, right click on the panel inventory game object and select UI button. This will make sure the newly created button becomes a child of the panel inventory. If for whatever reason, this is not the case in the hierarchy window after the creation of the buttons, Simply drag the newly created button under the panel inventory panel. Do this for all five categories. Rename the buttons appropriately, for example, but weapons category, and so on. Change the caption of the button so that it reflects the function of the button. Also, rename the text element to something like the following, text weapons category, and so on. Finally, add a new panel element to the panel inventory again by selecting the panel inventory game object and right clicking and selecting UI panel. Rename the newly created panel, panel category. Your inventory user interface should look something like the screenshot shown. Before we get more involved, let's go ahead and hook up some of the basics for showing and hiding the inventory interface for the player. To do this, we will need to modify the UI controller. I will not be showing the whole source file, as we will do that later in this section. These are the changes for each script for now. Added a new function named display inventory and a new variable to reference the inventory canvas named inventory canvas. Level controller.
updated the onLevelWasLoaded function to assign the UI controller game object to the game master instance if one is present. Modified the update function to check to see if the J key was pressed and released. This in turn toggled a Boolean variable to see if we are supposed to show or hide the inventory interface. If you test your scene from the main menu, you will be able to test out the interface and toggle it on and off. Don't forget that you will need to disable the canvas for the inventory system at design time or at runtime when the game loads initially. The next challenge for us is to create a method to dynamically populate the inventory items and displaying them properly on the user interface. We are going to use two new UI elements that we have not used before. We will be using a scroll view to give us the ability to scroll through the items when needed. We are also going to take a look at some of the layout UI elements that are available out of the box in Unity 5.x. Let's first get the scroll view set up and also be able to add a simple UI prefab to the scroll view. Once this is done, we can go ahead and enhance the UI prefab to handle what we have outlined previously. We need to make a way to display multiple inventory items on the screen. We now need to learn how to create a scrollable view for the inventory UI. Go to the scene where you have created your inventory UI and select Panel Category in the Canvas. Right click and select UI Scroll View to add a scroll view UI element. You should now have a scroll view UI element with the associated children under your panel category, Panel. The children are going to be Viewport, Scroll Bar Horizontal and Scroll Bar Vertical. Make your adjustment to the Scroll View UI element before you delete the children. We are going to make some modifications to the default Scroll View. Go ahead and delete the following from the Scroll View, Scroll Bar Horizontal, Scroll Bar Vertical and Viewport Child elements. After you are done, your screen should look something like in the screenshot shown. Next, we need to add a panel element as a child to our scroll view. Go ahead and select the scroll view and right click and select UI Panel. Rename the newly added panel, Panel Item. We need to add two layout components to our panel item. To do this, select the panel item and from the inspector window, select Add Component, Layout, Vertical Layout Group and once more select Add Component, Layout, Content Size Filter. Go ahead and modify the following attributes under the Vertical Layout Group components. Set the left, right, top and bottom padding to 3. Set the spacing to 0. Change the child alignment to upper left and the child force expand to true for both width and height. For the Content Size Filter component, set the horizontal fit to unconstrained and the vertical fit to min size. Finally, in the Rec Transform component, change the anchor point to top center and modify the position Y to minus 10. At this point, we have the basic framework in place. The next step is to populate our newly created scroll view. For starters, let's go ahead and add a text element under the Panel Item panel. Again, select the Panel Item element and right click and select UI Text. Next, select the text element and rename it text item element. We need to add a new component to the text element from the inspector window. Go ahead and select add component, layout, layout element. We need a means to access and modify the text attribute of the new text UI element. In order to do this, we need to create a new script called inventory item UI. The code will just have a public variable that will reference the text element. Here is the listing. Finally, Drag and drop the text element from the hierarchy window into the text item element attribute of the inventory item UI component attached to the text item element object. Refer to the preceding screenshot. The script is used to self reference. We will use it to modify the text component of the text UI element. Now, we will need to create a prefab of the text item element by dragging and dropping it into a designated folder. I have created a new folder under my prefabs folder named it UI, and created the prefab in that folder. Refer to the previous screenshot. You can now delete the text item element from the hierarchy window under the panel item object. We will be adding them dynamically during runtime. There is one last configuration you will need to do before we move forward. You will need to add a mask component to the scroll view UI element. Select the scroll view from the hierarchy window, and from the inspector window, select add component, UI, mask. After the addition of the mask component, make sure that the show mask graphics attribute is unchecked. Now it is time to add our inventory item placeholder dynamically 
to the panel item UI element. To do so, we will use the UIController.cs script. Go ahead and open up the script and add the following variable to the class. In the designer, you will need to assign the panel item UI element from the canvas game object and the text item element prefab from the prefab folder. Next, we are going to modify the update function so that when we press the H key on the keyboard, it will go ahead and initiate a new inventory item element and make it a child element of the panel item object. Here is the code shown. This code shown simply initiates the prefab and makes it a child of the panel item element. We are also changing the caption of the element and placing it with a timestamp to see the uniqueness of each UI element. Let's check out the outcome now. At this point, we have put together the main elements to have our inventory interface list items dynamically and be able to scroll through them. To create the actual inventory item user interface, we are going to need to use several UI elements. We will need a panel to be the container of the item. Within the panel, we are going to use an image, a text, and two button UI elements. I will not be going through the steps of how to put the panel together. You should know how to create the user interfaces by now. Just make sure that you add the layout element component and inventory item UI script to the panel that will be the base for the inventory item. Since the UI component has been modified, we also have to update the inventory item UI.cs script to contain a reference to all of the new UI elements in the panel. Here is the code for the new inventory item UI. We also need to update the UI controller script to handle the new prefab accordingly. Here is the code for the new UI prefab in UI controller. The main concept I want to point out is the implementation of the on-click event handler for the buttons within the prefab. Since we are dynamically generating our UI and hence the buttons, we need to be able to trigger the on-click function somewhere. This is done by adding a listener as shown in the code. For now, when you click the but add button, you will get an output on the console window with the appropriate caption. When you click the but delete button, you will get another output on the console window with the appropriate caption. Then the item will be destroyed. In other words, removed from the inventory. In this video, we have learned about the inventory interface. In the next video, we will integrate the UI with the actual inventory system. Hi, and welcome to the next video, integrating the UI with the actual inventory system. In the previous video, we learned about the inventory interface. In this video, we're going to learn about hooking the category buttons and displaying the data. Then, we're also going to test the inventory system. We've seen and implemented concepts necessary to make our inventory system UI work properly. Now, it is the time to actually fill the user interface with the actual data that is stored in the game master. Using the UIController.cs script, we are going to create five new methods that will handle a proper visualization of our inventory system. We are going to add the following five functions. Display weapons category, display armor category, Display Clothing Category, Display Health Category, Display Potions Category. We also need to clear the existing inventory items from the panel when the user switches from one category to the next. This will require a private function named Clear Inventory Item Panel that will just do that. Here is the listing for the new UI controller script. We had to also make some modifications to the inventory system script to make it possible for us to access properties storing the data easier. Here is the new listing of the script. Notice that I have removed the code from the update function in the UI controller script as it was only for testing reasons. For testing purposes, I have placed a number of inventory item prefabs I have created earlier in this section. Start the game from the main menu and go through the character customization scene to save the character player and start the game. Once you're in the playable scene, go ahead and collect a few of the items that have been placed over the scene. Notice that I've selected the underscore game master game object to display the inventory data in the inspector window. We have picked up two weapon types and two armor types. The weapon items we have picked up are Axe 1 and Club 1. The armor items we have picked up are HL02 and SP01, as indicated in the inspector window. In the game window, when we bring up the inventory window for display and click the weapons button, 
we get two listings. The listing displays the proper data for each inventory item in the category. To list the armour items in the inventory, we will click the armour button. The following screenshot will display the items in the armour category in the inventory based on our data. We have come a long way. Let's take a moment to put things in perspective. We first created the following scripts that lay the foundation for our inventory system in the game. BaseItem.cs InventoryItem.cs InventoryItemAgent.cs InventorySystem.cs The next step was to create the prefab for each inventory item and add it to the InventoryItemAgent.cs script. This would in turn allow us to assign the necessary data to identify the prefab as an inventory item during gameplay. Next, we started work on the design and development of the user interface for the inventory system. We created a sketch of how we would like the inventory window to look and implemented the framework using the build in UI architecture. Slowly, adding the UI and applying different concepts and new elements, we built the final user interface for the inventory system. Finally, we used the prefabs to test the complete addition and removal of the inventory items from the user interface. The next challenge we face is how to actually apply the inventory items to the player character. In this video, we integrated the UI with inventory system. In the next video, we will talk about inventory items and the player. Hi, and welcome to the last video of this section. Inventory items and the player. In the previous video, we looked at the integration of UI and the actual inventory system. In this video, we are going to take a look at inventory items and the player character. Then, we will be applying inventory items and finally check how it looks. Now that we have seen how to create the inventory system, we need to be able to utilize it during gameplay to apply changes to our player character. In this section, we are going to examine how to do just that. Here are some of the new features we need to work on. Applying selected inventory items to the player character. Performing accounting on both the player character and the inventory system. Updating the game state accordingly. We need to make some design decisions about how we are going to apply the inventory items to the player character, and in turn, how the system will handle the event. For instance, let's assume the player character has acquired several weapons. Let's say weapons A, B and C. Let's also assume that, initially, the player does not have any active weapons. Now, the player selects to activate weapon A. For this scenario, we would just use the inventory item data and activate weapon A for the player, taking into consideration all of the accounting that comes with the weapon. Now, the player wants to change his or her weapon to B because it is more powerful and they would need it to defeat the boss. Since the player already has weapon A active, what are we going to do with it before we activate weapon B? Do we put it back into the game world, or do we put it back into our inventory for later consumption? In our case, once you have an item in the inventory, it will stay with you until you actually delete it from the inventory, in which case it will be destroyed. We need to make a few code modifications and also some prefab modifications to have everything working together. Let's start with the inventoryitem.cs script. We are going to add new data to store the type of the inventory item. This is necessary because we have a category, and within the category we have different types of items. This is specifically true for the armor category. For instance, we have a helmet, a shield, a shoulder pad, and so on. Here is the code listing. When you make the update to your script, make sure to go back into the IDE and select the proper type for each prefab we have created to represent your inventory items. You will need to update the type field for each prefab you have created for your inventory items. We would also need to update the PC.cs script. We 
we're going to make private the original data variables and create public properties to access them. This way, if we need to perform any extra work prior to or after setting or getting the property value, we can do so easily. Here is the listing for the pc.cs script. The next code modification will be on the character customization.cs script. Since this script has been used in the character customization scene, we can utilize the same script and expand it to apply the visual changes to our player character. But before we can utilize this script, we will need to copy the actual components from the base game object defined in our character customization scene and paste it into the PC underscore CC game object representing our player character. When you copy a component using the gear menu in the inspector window, all the configurations, links and references stay intact. When you paste the components using again the gear menu in the inspector window, you will have an exact copy of the component. This will eliminate the need for us to rewire all of the game objects to their references in the script. The following will illustrate the copy of the components from the base game object to the PC underscore CC game object. This works because the script is actually referencing the different parts of the PC underscore CC game object hierarchy in the first place. The difference was that it used to be attached to the base game object for the customization. Can they both be active at the same time in the same scene at this point? Yes. However, if you have the time, you might want to redo your UI event triggers to use the PC underscore CC game object, and then you can remove the character customization.cs script from the base game object. Now we actually need to modify the character customization.cs script to activate the different parts of the player character model using the data it will receive from the game master.cs script. Here is a partial listing of the character customization.cs script. I have not listed the whole script as it will take a lot of pages, but the basic concept is to overload the set functions so that they will perform the necessary tasks based on the parameters coming in, such as, for the previous example, pc.weapon underscore type. The next script that needs to be modified is the uicontroller.cs script. This is where we are going to modify the five functions we created previously to actually apply the changes to the player character. Let's look at one of the functions that have been modified without listing the whole code. If you notice, we are also saving the item from the for each loop into the inviteItem.item variable. This is important to make sure the on click listener is picking up the current inventory item from the list. The bulk of the work is being done in the on click dot add listener function for each button. We are basically setting the selected weapon using the game master dot instance to store and then we are calling the player weapon changed function to handle some more features. You will see that in the next code listing. You will need to handle each add button listener in similar fashion based on how you have designed and implemented your code and your prefabs. Finally, we are going to make some modifications to the gamemaster.cs script. Here is the listing. The only function I want to have you take note of is the player armor changed function. 
It is because of this function that we have to add the new type data variable and the data type to the inventory item class. We have a lot of different types of armor and we needed a way to distinguish between them. Based on the armor type, we would then call the appropriate function to activate them on the player character. This chapter was a bit involved in regard to configuring your game objects and prefabs and more importantly the code that went along to glue everything together. I have tried to keep things as simple as possible. Here is this player character prior to picking up the inventory items placed on the level. Notice that the inventory is empty in the game master object and also there are no selected items in the PC underscore CC object. After I move the player character to pick up the inventory items, I will use the hotkey program to bring up the inventory window. In my case, the J key. And now let's see how things change when we apply a few of the imagery items to the player character. In this video, we have applied selected imagery items to the player character. In this section, we began by discussing the weighted inventory and gave a brief overview of its concept. We also determined the item types. Then, we created the inventory item prefabs and implemented the user interface for our inventory system. Finally, we integrated the inventory system with the inventory UI and created a fully functional inventory system. In the next section, we will improve on our game's user interface and feedback system. Hi and welcome to the new section, user interface and system feedback. In the previous section, we created a simple generic inventory system. In this section, we are going to keep on improving on our game's user interface and feedback system. We are going to create a heads-up display that will be responsible for managing the user interaction with the system menus and also the system giving feedback to the player. Now, we move on to the first video of this section, designing a heads-up display. In this video, we have basic information about HUD and then we will be designing our HUD by the end, we will be looking at the HUD framework. The HUD is the interface through which your players can interact with the virtual world and receive feedback from the virtual world environment. Any simple heads up display will have, at a minimum, a way to display the following information. Basic information about the player character, health, mana, strength, level, etc. Current inventory items consumed by the player character current weapon used by the player, current armor used by the player, available potions and or health, feedback from the game environment, anything useful pertaining to the game, power-ups, level-ups, etc. Let's go ahead and design a HUD that will be useful for our game, and at the same time we will keep it simple but useful. We should have a HUD that will display the basic player character information in a way it does not block the gameplay but at the same time gives critical information to the player regarding their character state. We should also design a way to display the current inventory items that the player has activated to be used, such as the weapon or the armor. Finally, we should also have a simple way for the player to use any health packets and or potions they might have during gameplay. Here is a quick sketch of what I want for my HUD to look like. Again. You are free and in fact I encourage you to come up with your own design. I have roughly marked what I would like my HUD to look like during gameplay. Notice that I have kept it simple. In the top left corner I have placed the immediate information about the player we need to have, such as their health and perhaps their strength. In the bottom left corner I have placed a scroll bar panel that will list all of the active inventory items that the player may have active on their player character and on the right side of the screen I have three slots that will be used for immediate access to things such as health packets and or potions that the player might need to use during their gameplay. Now that we have an understanding of what we want our UI to look like, let's actually start implementing it in Unity. We need to create a new canvas to hold our HUD. 
To create this, right click in the hierarchy window and select UI Canvas. Rename the new Canvas game object to Canvas HUD. Go ahead and implement the necessary UI sections as outlined. We will need three main panels for each section indicated screen. These are the three main panels for each section as indicated in the design. Character information in the top left screen corner, active inventory items in the bottom left corner of the screen, a special items panel in the right mid section of the screen. Create each panel by right clicking the hierarchy window and selecting UI panel. Make sure the panels are a child of the canvas HUD game object. Rename each panel accordingly. I have named mine panel character info, panel active items, and panel special items. In this video, we have designed a heads up display. In the next video, we'll complete and manage the HUD design. Hi guys, hope you're all enjoying this learning. We will now look at the next video, completing HUD design. In the previous video, we designed and developed the HUD display. In this video, we're going to take a look at panel character info and also at panel active inventory items. Finally, we're going to talk about special items panel. I would like to start with the panel character info. From a design point of view, the panel that will contain the visual components for the character is not going to be very complex. The panel will consist of five images. The main image will be used to hold an avatar of the character. The other four images will be used to display the health and manner of the character. Since these values are going to be displayed in a bar format, we are using two images for each item. One of the images is going to host the border and the other the representation of the actual value. To come up with the images, I'm going to use external tools such as Photoshop. Microsoft Expression Design is a good tool for creating frames and so on. I've made a nice image portraying the avatar of the player character. The image size I have generated is 301 by 301 pixels. To create the graphics for the bars representing the health and the mana for our character player, we will actually need to have three images. One image will represent the negative value of the bar, one image will represent the positive value of the bar, and the third being the border image for the bar. They will be overlaid on top of each other to create the illusion of our graphic bars. Creating the three distinct sprites and overlaying them will give you a good illusion of what we're looking for. After exporting our images, we need to import them into Unity. Use your file system to move your images from their original location to the assets folder under your Unity project. I have placed my textures in the directory Assets Textures CH7. Once you have moved them into the desired location within your Unity project, you will need to convert the images to sprites. Select all of the images that will be used for the GUI, and from the inspector window, change the texture type to Sprite, 2D and UI. It's time to apply our textures to the actual UI element we have defined under the panel character info panel within the canvas object. There are a few steps that need to be performed before we can fully apply the UI elements to the HUD. The first thing you should do, if you have not done so already, is create three new UI image elements under the panel character info panel by right clicking the panel and selecting UI image. Notice the order of the images representing the health bar. The image that is representing the green bar will need to be modified using the inspector window. Select it and change the image type to filled. Change the fill method to horizontal and the fill origin to left. We're going to be using the fill amount to control the visual part of our health bar. Notice that I have set it to 0.77 for demonstration purposes. By default, when the game starts, we will be starting at a fill amount of 1, which is equivalent to 100%. For the player character's health, 0.77 is equivalent to 77%, and so on. We are going to apply the same technique to our mana bar. Go ahead and create two more images that represent the two backgrounds for our mana bar. We will be using the same border image for both bars. Again. Don't forget you will need to make the appropriate changes to the imported textures within Unity. Convert them to Sprite, 2D and UI. Texture Type Create the necessary image UI element under the panel 
and apply the textures to the image element within the canvas. You should have something like the following screenshot. That's all there is to it. Not bad for a person with no artistic background. The active inventory items display is a visual indication of the items that have been activated within the inventory. It is important to keep in mind that we are more interested in learning the concepts and applying them in a simple example that you can expand upon and improve on your own. The basic idea is to create a scrollable panel that will be used to add items as needed. We've already shown you how to set up a scrollable view and how to configure the UI components to support what we are trying to achieve. From the hierarchy window, click on Panel Active Inventory Items and select UI Scroll View. Don't forget to make a prefab of the UI element that will be representing your active inventory item in the panel. You will also need a script to reference the UI element designated for your items. I have called this script Active Inventory Item UI and currently there are two attributes. One is a reference to the image element and the other a reference to the text element. We will need to eventually integrate all of these scripts together to make things work properly. Now we are going to look at the design of our last panel. The main difference between this panel and the last one that we developed is the orientation. Everything else will be exactly the same. However, for this panel our orientation is going to be vertical instead of horizontal. The procedure to create the panel has already been discussed several times and you should not have any trouble creating it. I have let you make your own textures and images to be applied to the UI elements. As I was designing the special items panel, I came up with a better idea for how to improve the panel UI. You might want to have a static icon representing each special item and have a counter attached to the UI representing how many you have of each item. Each time you collect one it will increase and each time you consume one it will decrease. Here is what the current HUD looks like based on our design. We need to now start thinking about integrating the HUD user interface with the code base we have developed so far. In this video, we have designed the complete HUD display. In the next video, we will be integrating the code. In the previous video, we looked at completing the HUD design. In this video, we are going to support the new UI features and also update the other scripts to incorporate the HUD functionality. Finally, we will apply inventory items from our inventory to the player character. Now that we have our HUD design up and running, we will need to integrate the UI elements with the actual code that will be deriving them. There are a few scripts that are going to be created to support the new UI features and a few that will be updated to glue everything together. The following scripts have been created, Active Inventory Item UI, Active Special Item UI and HUD Element UI. These scripts are going to be used in the HUD user interface to give us access to the elements. For instance, you will need to attach the HUD elements UI.cs script to the canvas HUD game object. This screen illustrates how the HUD canvas is configured with the HUD elements UI script. Now, let's take a look at the prefabs we've created to represent the UI elements to be used for the panels. There are two. I've named them panel active item and panel special item. I will discuss panel special item as it contains everything panel active item contains, plus an additional script that is attached to it for event handling. What we have just covered was the implementation of the scripts that are used to get access to the proper UI element within the HUD canvas. You will notice that for the panel special item prefab, there are two new and very important components that we have attached to it. One is the event trigger within Unity, and the other is the active special item UI script, which is used to handle the point to click event for the special item. Now we are ready to update the other scripts we have already developed to incorporate the HUD functionality. The scripts that will need to be modified are inventory system and UI controller. Here is the code for inventory system. Now that you have everything in place, you can go ahead and test run the game to make sure everything is working as expected. This is also a good time to debug your code and your project settings if you have not done so already. I have to make the following point once again. The idea is to grasp the concept. 
we are looking at one way to implement what we want to achieve. You might come up with a better way along the way, or decide to do something totally different. I encourage that. Here, the player character has picked up a few of the inventory items we have placed in the level. When you bring up the inventory window and click on any one of the categories defined, that is weapons, you will get a listing of all the weapons that we have in our inventory and so forth. We've collected one weapon type, one health packet, and a couple of defensive items. Notice that our special items panel is displaying an item. This is the health packet we have picked up. Let's see how the HUD updates itself when the player starts consuming some of the inventory items by adding them using the inventory window during gameplay. Notice that we have activated three inventory items, a weapon named Axe 2, and two armors of type Helmet and Shield named HL02 and SL01 respectively. You can see them on the player character, as well as in the panel holding the active inventory items. Pretty cool. We've applied some of the inventory items from our inventory to the player character, and now we can actually go and face the enemy. We're going to allow the enemy to attack us to see how our health reduces. Then, we will use the health packets from our special items panel to increase our health once more. Now, let's go meet our non-player character. You can see that he is attacking our player. The health of our player is decreasing, and finally he is dead. You can see as soon as I clicked on health packet, the health increased. We are going to run away and apply our health packet. We will go to our enemy again. The enemy is trying to kill the player, so we can click on HP1 to get some health here. This was just an example. You saw that by clicking on the health packet, the health was increased by 10% of the total health. The health packet is a strength and weight of 0.2, translating to 20 points on a scale of 0 to 100. In this video, we have successfully integrated the code. In the next video, we will display the basic health and strength of the enemy. Hi, and welcome to the next video, Enemy Stats in the HUD. In the previous video, we learned how to integrate the actual code. In this video, we are going to design and develop the Panel Active Items panel. Then, we will be creating the necessary prefabs to be placeholders for the inventory items, and also the scripts that would make them work together. We will start off by displaying the information for the NPC upon reaching a certain distance between the player character and the NPC. We can even make this distance the same as the line of sight we have set for the NPC. This is good because if they can see us, then they are close enough for us to see their stats. Let's get to work. We are going to be using some of the existing textures that we have created for our player character. The main difference between the canvas we are going to create for the NPC and the one we have been creating for the player is some of the configurations. One of the main differences is going to be the render mode of the canvas. The NPC canvas is going to have a world space render mode. This will allow us to position the canvas as another game object within the scene. The next important difference will be the rec transform attributes, and more importantly, the scale and rotation attributes. To make life easier, all you need to do is create the canvas and change its properties as shown in the preceding screen. For the next step, you can copy the whole panel character info we have developed in the previous sections, and paste it as a child of the new canvas. This way, you will not have to recreate each UI element one by one, and this will help save a lot of time. However, you will need to change the scale and the transform properties in the panel character info panel, the new one, to arrange it so that it renders above the NPC's head. The next step is for us to be able to control the values of the stat bars 
from the code. For this, we're going to create a new script called NPC stat UI and attach it to the canvas object we just created for the NPC stats. I've renamed the canvas to canvas NPC stats. Here is a listing of the script. The script we just created will only give us a reference to the image elements. We still need to be able to have a method to update the values. We need to find a way to reference all of the NPC characters in a given scene. Once that is determined, we will need to set the initial values of the health and strength bar. Then, during gameplay, we will need to be able to update each NPC stats according to the state of the game. In order for us to identify the NPCs in a given scene, we are going to use the tag element defined in each game object. We need to create a new tag named enemy, and every NPC that is of enemy type will need to be tagged as such. This is an easy way to do a quick search and get a list of game objects based on their tag value. You should also start thinking about how you are going to dynamically attach the NPC stats canvas to the NPC on runtime. At the moment, for testing purposes, I'm going to leave it attached to the model. But the question is, where do you actually attach it? Well, we have an empty game object named follow attached to our model prefab. Since this is driven from our player character model, we have embedded the follow as a placeholder for the main camera during gameplay. For the NPC, we are going to use it to attach the NPC canvas as a child game object to the follow game object in the model hierarchy. We are going to use the npc underscore agent dot cs script to initialize the npc status canvas prefab and the appropriate values of the UI elements. This is the best place to place the initialization because it will be self-contained. Here is the new listing for the script. Note that you will need to assign canvas npc stats attachment, which will be used to store a reference to the game object we are going to attach to the npc canvas and canvas npc stats prefab will be used to assign the prefab representing the npc status canvas at design time. If you run the game now, you will have the prefab instantiated dynamically and attached to the follow game object in the hierarchy, with the fill value set to 1f, that is, 100%. We need to take a moment and go back to some of the initial scripts and configurations we created in the early chapters, where we defined the player character's animation controller and charactercontroller.cs script. Open the animator controller named CH3 Animator Controller. Select the parameters tab and create a new parameter called attack1c of float data type. We have defined the curve only for one of the attack animations. Once you have configured the parameter in the animator controller for the player character, we have to update the charactercontroller.cs script to trigger an attack based on the parameter value. In the code, we check to see if any of the attack modes are active. And if so, we check to see what the curve parameter attack1c is at the moment of the animation. If we are at 1.0f, then we call the game master object to perform the rest. Now, we need to take a look at a few functions we have defined or modified in the game master script. Some explanation is needed here. The function on level was loaded is called each time a new scene is being loaded at runtime. This is where we query all game objects that are tagged enemy. We then store them internally for further processing down the line. For testing purposes, and due to the simplicity of the scene, there is only one enemy present for testing. I am also setting the closest NPC enemy object to the last game object tagged enemy. 
This variable is later used in the player attack enemy function to set the NPC's health property. When the player attack enemy function is called, we get a reference to the NPC component of the NPC character and reduce the health based on the attack. Now, this also forces us to update the base character script. Here is a listing of the modification. In the health property, we check to see if we are the player or the NPC. If we are the player, we need to use the game master to update our stats UI. If we are going to update our own NPC stats UI, This means that when you're creating your player character and or NPC, you will need to make sure you are assigning the data elements properly. See here. The preceding code snippet is the awake from the player agent script. You will need to perform the same for the NPC agent script. In this video, we handled and managed the statistics and the visual representation of the NPC with the player. In the next video, we will be enhancing the code to implement the player character's movement. Hello, we have now reached the last video of this section, enhancing the code. In the previous video, we looked at a fully functional inventory system that can be expanded as needed. In this video, we will be making a few changes in the character movement script. We will also be calculating the impact for NPC objects. Finally, we will learn how to track the hit points between the player character and the NPC. One last code implementation I would like is to determine which NPC is closest to us based on distance and also our view angle toward the NPC. We've already created the logic to determine these quantities for the NPC character and we need to implement something similar for the player character. Let's take a look at a partial listing of the code changes we need to make for the character movement script. The way we calculate the sighting and distance of the enemy NPCs is through ray casting. This is done only when we are in attack mode. We check to see if the NPC is in front of us, and if so, we set the closest NPC enemy object in the game master and set the flag enemy in sight, where we then perform the necessary subtraction from the health of the NPC. Notice that I have also changed the way we are computing the impact of the hit based on a simple equation. Where PC is the object reference to our player character, the same equation is used on the NPC objects. This is just a simple demonstration that the impact of the hit point of the player or the NPC is based on the strength and the health of the actors in the scene. In turn, you can derive the strength value from the components that the player or the NPC has activated throughout the gameplay. Here is a partial listing of base character.cs illustrating the health property. This is how the terrain looks after making some changes to the environment. You are encouraged to do some research and try different types of mechanics and implementation to enhance your skills. In this video, we enhanced our code. In this section, we started out with a design concept and created a layout for our HUD before the implementation. We also integrated the UI element with actual code. We then designed and developed the panel active items panel 
and built the necessary scripts to integrate the UI elements with the game master. By the end, we concentrated on implementing the player character's movement and detecting the NPCs. In the next section, we will build a simple project called Multiplayer Game. Welcome to the last section of this course, Multiplayer Setup. In the previous section, we talked about user interface and system feedback. In this section, we will talk about the challenges of a multiplayer game and initial multiplayer game. Then, we will be implementing the network enabling RPG characters and testing the network enabled PC and NPC. Now, we move on to the first video of this section that deals with the challenges of a multiplayer game. In this video, we are going to take a look at types of online multiplayer game design and challenges with real world multiplayer game. The general rule of thumb is, if you don't need to enable your game to be multiplayer, don't. It just adds a whole lot of complexity and extra requirements and specifications that you will need to start worrying about. But if you must, then you must. You probably know by now that creating even the simplest multiplayer game will have its own challenges that you will need to address as the game designer. There are different types of online multiplayer game design, real-time multiplayer games, turn-based multiplayer games, asynchronous multiplayer games, local multiplayer games. The most challenging out of all the different types of multiplayer games is real-time multiplayer gaming. This is because all players have to be synchronized in a proper and effective way with the latest game state at any given time. That is, if we have player A perform a specific action, player B will see the action at the same time on his or her screen. Now, consider we have another player join the game, player C. Player A and B will need to be synchronized with player C and in turn player C will need to synchronize its own environment with player A's and player B's state. Not just the actual position or rotation of the players has to be synchronized, but also all of the player data will need to be synchronized. Now, imagine what happens when you multiply this by a hundred, or a thousand, or a million connected players. For a real world multiplayer game, what we are going to cover here is not enough and what Unity provides out of the box is not enough either. Chances are that you will need to write your own server-side code to handle the player data. In this video, we saw the challenges involved in designing and developing multiplayer games. In the next video, we will talk about initial multiplayer game. Hello, and welcome to the next video, initial multiplayer game. In the previous video, we looked at the challenges of a multiplayer game. In this video, we are going to take a look at fundamental networking components and the networking project. Then, we will be adding player character and the enemy tank. Finally, we will be building and testing a new instance for our game. This project is based on the Unity networking tutorial, but has been extended to have some other features implemented that will be helpful in the implementation of networking in our RPG. We need to get familiar with some networking components that will be used for the creation of our network enabled games. These components are Network Manager The Network Manager is a higher level class that allows you to control the state of a networked game. It provides an interface in the editor to control the configuration of the network, the prefabs used for spawning, and the scenes to use for different network game states. Network Manager HUD this provides a default user interface for controlling the network state of the game. It also shows information about the current state of the network manager in the editor. Network Identity The network identity component is at the heart of the new networking system. This component controls an object's network identity and it makes the networking system aware of it. Network Transform The network transform component synchronizes movement of game objects across the network. This component takes authority into account, so local player objects synchronize their position from the client to the server, then out to other clients. Other objects with server authority synchronize their position from the server to clients. 
This project is used to demonstrate the concepts of a multiplayer game. The concepts can then be applied to more complex scenarios. We will start by creating a new Unity project. All multiplayer games need to have a network manager implemented. To do this, we're going to create an empty game object and rename it to Network Manager. Now, attach the Network Manager component to the newly created object using the Inspector window and navigating to Add Component, Network, Network Manager. We are also going to add the Network Manager HUD component to the selected game object. Again, from the Inspector window, navigate to Add Component, Network, Network Manager HUD. We are now going to be adding a simple character player. You can really use any primitive game object to represent your PC. I'm going to create my player to take the shape of a simple tank. You can see the hierarchy of the tank game object. I am not going to cover how to create the game object, as you should be able to do that very easily by now. What I will cover is how to enable the new tank game object network enabled. We are going to attach two network components to the tank game object. The first one is going to be network identity, which can be added by selecting the tank game object and from within the inspector window, navigating to add component, network, network identity. When you are done adding the component, make sure to check the local player authority property checkbox. The local player authority allows the object to be controlled by the client that owns it. Next, we need to add the network transform component to the tank game object. Again, selecting the tank game object from the inspector window and navigate to add component, network, network transform to add the component. We are going to keep the default values for the network transform component. You can read more on the different properties on your own using the online documentation. The main attribute you may want to adjust is the network send rate. Next, we want to create a script that allows us to control the movement of the tank. Go ahead and create a new C Sharp script and name it Player Controller. So, first create a folder called Scripts and then create a script in it. Here is the script for that. The code is pretty straightforward, but there are some important concepts that we need to discuss. First and foremost, you will note that we are inheriting from the network behavior instead of mono behavior. Network behavior is used to work with objects with the network identity component. This allows you to perform network related functions such as commands, client RPCs, sync events, and sync vars. Synchronizing variables is one of the important aspects of a multiplayer game. If you recall, one of the challenges of multiplayer games was the ability to make sure all of the key data for the game is synchronized across the server and the clients. This is accomplished by the sync var attribute. You will see how this is applied in the next script we are going to create for the health of the Unity. These are functions that are invoked on network behavior script for various network events. Here is a list. On start server. This is called when an object is spawned on the server or when the server is started for objects in the scene. On start client. This is called when the object is spawned on the client or when the client connects to a server for objects in the scene. On serialize. This is called to gather state to send from the server to clients. On deserialize. This is called to apply a state to objects on clients. On network destroy. This is called on clients when server told the object to be destroyed. On start local player. This is called on clients for player objects for the local client only. On rebuild observers. This is called on the server when the set of observers for an object is rebuild. On set local visibility. This is called on a host when the visibility of an object changed for the local client. On check observer. This is called on the server to check visibility state for a new client. In the player controller script that we just created, you will note that we are using the on start client to highlight the local player by changing its material color to blue. 
Commands are the way for clients to request a function to be performed on the server. In a server authoritative system, clients can only do things through commands. Commands are run on the player object on the server that corresponds to the client that sent the command. This routine happens automatically, so it is impossible for a client to send a command for a different player. A command must begin with the prefix command and have the custom attribute on them. In our player controller script, when the player fires, it sends a command to the server using the command fire function. Client RPC calls are a way for server objects to cause things to happen on client objects. This is the reverse direction to how commands send messages, but the concepts are the same. Client RPC calls, however, are not only invoked on player objects, they can be invoked on any network identity object. They must begin with the prefix RPC and have the client RPC custom attribute. We would need a way to also keep track of our player character's health. This will be done using a new script called health.cs. So here is the code for it. Notice in this script, we are also inheriting from network behavior. The two main items I want to bring to your attention are the sync var and the onStart client functions and client RPC. We want to synchronize the player's health across the network. To do this, we use the sync var network behavior. Sync var can be any basic type, not classes, lists, or other collections. When the value of a sync var is changed on the server, it will be sent to all of the ready clients in the game. When objects are spawned, they are created on the client with the latest state of all sync vars from the server. The onStart client function makes sure that each object with the health.cs script attached to it will have the most up-to-date value to display on the health bar UI. The next function is the RPC respawn function. In the take damage function, we check the health of the current game object. The health drops below zero, we check to see if the destroy on death boolean variable is set. If it is not set, we go ahead and reset the current health value to max health value. And we use the RPC respawn method to respawn the player at the origin. Remember, this function is executed on all clients. Within the function, we check to see if the caller is the local player by checking the variable of local player. Yes, creating a multiplayer game does get confusing. This will become apparent more as you start experimenting with it more. Okay, so we need to create a prefab that will represent our cannonballs. Very simple, create a sphere and make it the same size as the nozzle of your tank gun. You can check the size of the nozzle if you want to. Let's create a sphere and change its size that is similar to that of the nozzle. Name it as Cannonball. We're going to need to attach the following components to the Cannonball game object. Network Identity. Network Transform. Rigid Body. And a Bullet.cs script. Make sure that you set the Use Gravity property as false on the Rigid Body component. Also, Make sure that both server only and local player authority properties are false on the network identity component. On the network transform component, change the network send rate to. Once we generate the object on the server, the physics will take care of the motion on each client. Create a new C -sharp script called bullet.cs. Here is the script. All we are doing here is detecting a collision. If there is a collision, we get the health component. If the health component is not null, we call the take damage function and pass is a value. If you recall from the health.cs script, the take damage function reduces the current health of the player, which in return is a sync var that gets updated on all active clients. This line shows the current health. One item we did not discuss is the idea of a hook. A sync var can have a hook as shown in the script. Think of a hook as an event handler. 
The hook attribute can be used to specify a function to be called when the sync var changes value on the client. The onChangeHealth function is responsible to update the UI canvas for displaying our health value. Here is the code for it. Go ahead and make a prefab of the cannonball and delete the instance from the scene. Now, let's create a prefab. Make sure you have assigned the proper prefab association that are required on each script. For instance, the tank game object's player controller script needs a reference to the cannonball prefab and also the cannon spawn location. The health script needs a reference to the health bar foreground image, and so on. Now that we've created our tank game object and attached all of the necessary components and scripts to it, we need to make a prefab of it. This is because we are going to let the network manager spawn our player character. In order for it to be able to do so, it needs to refer to a prefab that is a representation of your player character. The network manager has a spawn info section that you can assign the player prefab, determine if the network manager can auto create the player, and the player spawn method. There is also a section for registered spawnable prefabs. We need to register all of the game objects that will be spawned by the network server. For instance, the cannonball prefab will need to be registered here so that we can spawn it across the network on different clients. Select the network manager game object in the scene and in the inspector window, assign the appropriate prefabs as needed. The network manager should look like this at this point. At this point, you are ready to test out what we have built so far. Go ahead and create a standalone version of your game using the build settings window. Once you have your build ready, launch two instances of the application. We are going to use one instance to host the game and the other to connect as a client. This is how our game instance will look like when you run it. Let's see how your screen will look after you click on the LAN host H button and move the tank player character around. Let's open some more game instances. Go to build and run and change the name to multi2. Save it and run. After playing it we can see that we have two of them on our screen. Repeat the process and open one more instance. Now this screen illustrates host or client with three clients. Notice in this screen each client has highlighted the player character it controls that is, the tank it controls. It is going to be difficult to capture the fire command, but you can go ahead and use the space bar to fire the cannon and it will be triggered accordingly on all active clients. You will also notice that the health of each tank will be reflected accurately if they do get a hit. If you move one character, movements are reflected on all the three clients. Now, we are ready to create an enemy to illustrate the non-player character in the game. Now it is time to add some of the non-player characters to our multiplayer demo. Adding the enemy tank is going to be simple, as we are going to use our tank prefab as a base. Go ahead and drop the tank prefab into the scene and change the name to tank enemy. Remove the player character script from the game object. We are going to create a separate script as the controller for the enemy tank. I have also gone ahead and applied different material to the enemy tank. So visually we can distinguish which tanks are going to be controlled by players and which ones are going to be non-player. So let's change the colour of the tank since this is our enemy. We can now easily recognise our enemy. Let's check how your tank and tank enemy prefab should look like. The main difference between the two is the controller script. Tank has the player controller script and tank enemy has enemy controller script. Here is the code for enemy controller script. The script continuously searches for all players that are active in the scene and makes a list of them. Then it finds the closest one to itself. 
Once it determines which player is closest, it rotates to face the player. Then, it calculates the distance between itself and the selected player. If the distance is shorter than the acceptable threshold, then it starts firing at the player. Each time the enemy tank fires, it actually calls a command, named Command Fire. This function is run on the server. It instantiates a cannonball prefab and spawns it on the network. The enemy controller.cs script also has a sync var for the player to attack variable, with a hook attached as an on change player to attack function. This in turn makes sure that all clients get updated with the latest data on each enemy tank game object. The health.cs script works the same as it does on the tank game object. There is one more item we need to cover, the spawning of the enemy tanks by the server. We need to attach enemy controller and health script to our tank enemy game object. Now, in the health bar we add foreground, add cannonball to bullet prefab, and also cannon spawn to bullet spawn. We can do this easily by creating another empty game object and naming it enemy spawner like this. We need to attach a network identity component and make sure we set the server only property to true. This will make sure that only the server can instantiate the enemy objects. The next step is to create the enemy spawner.cs script. Here is the code. This code technically takes the prefab provided as the enemy tank and randomly spawns each enemy tank within a range over the network. We need to make sure that all of our prefabs have been assigned in the inspector window for both the enemy spawner game object and the tank enemy game object. Create a prefab of your tank enemy if you have not done so already and delete it from the scene. Do not delete the enemy spawner. The enemy spawner game object should be placed in front of the cannon. Make sure that it is in this angle. Now adjust the tank properly. We need to register the tank enemy prefab with the network manager. Go ahead and select the Network Manager game object from the Inspector window. Add a new prefab to the Registered Spawnable Prefabs option. Your Network Manager should look like this now. We are ready to do our final test. Go ahead and build the standalone version of the project and launch a new instance of the game. Click on the LAN Host H button to start hosting a game. So this is our character. You can open as many tanks as you want simultaneously. It's working pretty good, isn't it? Now you see that all the enemies are trying to attack us. I'm trying to dodge from the attacks. The health of this enemy has been decreased a bit. In the new implementation, you will note that not only the player character tank gets spawned, but also the non-player character enemy tanks. You will also note that right after initialization, all of the enemy tanks are going to rotate toward the player character tank and if within range, they are going to start firing at it. This screen illustrates the initial scene. Note that while I was trying to capture the screen, the enemy tank were merciless and fired at my tank continuously. You can see that my health bar has reduced drastically. You can also note that one of the enemy tank has also received some damage. I assure you that I had nothing to do with the damage taken by the enemy tank, it was actually caused by friendly fire. Yes, at the moment the enemy tanks are not smart enough to hold fire if another teammate is in the line of fire. I will let you handle the implementation of that on your own, it shouldn't be too complex. Using ray casting to make sure there is no object between the enemy tank and the player prior to firing. Congratulations, you just created your first multiplayer game. As mentioned earlier, creating, maintaining and hosting a multiplayer game is no small task. 
and covering every single aspect on how to do it is simply impossible in a few pages. The idea here is to give you the foundation and the fundamentals that you can take and expand upon. I would encourage you to take some time and study what we have just covered, and do some more reading on the material, even though not much exists. The truth is that you will need to do a lot of experimentation and trial and error on your own. Now that we know the basics, let's go ahead and apply what you learned to our RPG assets. In this video, we successfully tested the initial multiplayer game. In the next video, we will learn how to enable the RPG characters. Welcome to the next video, Network Enabling RPG Characters. In the previous video, we looked at initial multiplayer game. In this video, we are going to create a scene for RPG and take a look at networked player and non-player character. Then, we will be learning how to synchronize player customization and items. And finally, we will be spawning NPC and other items. Create a new scene and save it as CH8 underscore networking. Place a terrain in the scene. Modify it so that it has a terrain width and terrain length of 30. Modify the position transform so that it is at minus 15, 0, minus 15. This will make the center of the terrain at the origin. Next, we're going to create an empty game object and name it Network Manager. We're also going to create another empty game object and name it Spawn Enemy. Select the Network Manager game object and attach the following components to it. Network Manager and Network Manager HUD. Using the Inspector windows, select Add Component, Network, Network Manager and Add Component. We will come back to these game objects later. We need to make our player character network enabled. Go ahead and drag the player prefab you created into the scene. We are going to use it as a base to create a new prefab that will be used for the networked version of the game. Go ahead and remove the existing character controller.cs and character customization components from the instance. We are going to create new scripts that are network enabled and use them. Rename the PC game object instance to PC CC network. Now, make a prefab of the instance. You should now have a new prefab named PC-CC-Network. Go ahead and attach the following components to the prefab. Network Identity, Network Transform, and Network Animator using the Inspector window and navigating to Add Components, Network, Component Name. On Network Identity Component, set the local player authority to True. On Network Transform component, change the Transform Sync mode to Sync Transform. On the Network Animator component, you will need to drag the Animator components attached to the game object into the Animator slot. You will need to select the Animator component and drag it right down into the Animator slot on the Network Animator components. We need to create a new character controller so that it is network compatible. Create a new C# -sharp script and call it Character Controller Network. Attach the script to the PC CC Network prefab. The new character controller is stripped down version of the original character controller. Here is the code for it. The first thing you should notice is that we are inheriting from network behavior instead of mono behavior. This is needed if we want to enable certain network behaviors on the game object. Let's look at some of the variables that need to be synchronized across the network for each player character that is connected. These variables are enemy to attack and health. There are two more variables, shield and helmet, which we will discuss later. In the update function, we need a way to check and make sure that it is the local player before giving the controller the chance to execute the player. This is done by having this code check to see if the current client is the local player. This will make sure that the code runs only for the current client player. The rest of the code in the update function checks to see if the enemy is in sight and makes sure the player character is facing the enemy to attack. If the player is in attack mode and the enemy is in our view, we set the enemy in sight to true and enemy to attack 
to the enemy game object which is stored in the hit attack variable of type recast hit. The important element here is the command enemy to attack function. The client needs to send a command to the server telling the server who the target of attack is. This will make sure the data is registered correctly on the server and it is synchronized to other clients. We also have another function called command enemy take damage that is used to reduce the health of the enemy character on the server. The server then calls the RPC enemy take damage function to synchronize across all clients the health value of the enemy. We also have this function to send commands to the server when the player dies. The highlighted functions make sure that the player character is dead and destroyed on all connected clients at the moment of the game. And finally, the following hook functions that are used by the sync var on health and enemy to attack variables. If you have not done so already, apply and save all of your changes to your PC CC network prefab. At this stage, your character is ready to be integrated with the network manager. You can drag and drop the prefab into the player prefab slot and build a standalone version to test out your character movement and synchronization. Just like the player character network enabled prefab, we will use the non-player character prefab as our base to get started. Go ahead and create an instance of your NPC in the scene. Go ahead and remove the existing NPC movement script components from the prefab. Rename the prefab to b1-network and attach the following component to it. Network identity, network transform, and network animator by navigating to add component, network, component name from the inspector window. On the network identity component, set the local player authority to true. In the network transform component, set the transform sync mode to sync transform. And for the network animator component, set the animator slot to the animator controller attached to the prefab by dragging it and dropping into the slot. We need to create a new script for our NPC movement that is network enabled. Let's create a new C-sharp script and name it NPC underscore movement underscore network. This is the script. There are a few variables that have been indicated as sync vars. These are die, distance, direction, angle, player in sight, field of view angle, calculated angle, player to attack, and health. Some of the sync vars have a hook. These are health, player to attack, player in sight, and die. In the update function, we check to make sure we are the server by this line. If we are the server, we use command update network and RPC update network functions to perform our duties. These are just for the movement and action of the NPC. The key here are the sync vars and hook functions that are used to synchronize the NPC data to all clients. That is all we need for the NPC. Go ahead and add the script to the prefab and apply the changes. Save it. In order for this to work, we need to perform several other configuration and creation of new inventory item prefabs. I'm going to use two inventory items to demonstrate this particular point. I'm going to use one of the helmet prefabs from my inventory items, duplicate it, and remove the inventory item aging component. We're going to create a new script that is network enabled as we did for our PC and NPC. Attach the components to the instance, network identity and network transform using add component, network, component name from the inspector window. Create a new script named inventory item agent underscore network. Here is the source code. All this script is doing is assigning the inventory item to the player character using the player armor changed function in the character controller network script. The player armor changed function uses another script we need to create that is network enabled, and that is the character customization network script. I will not list the script here as it is very long. We need a way to spawn our NPC and also the inventory items we are going to be using for the next demonstration. 
In the hierarchy window, right click on and select Create Empty. This will create an empty game object. Rename it to Spawn Enemy and add a network identity component to it by navigating to Add Component, Network, Network Identity from the inspector window. We are going to create a new script called Enemy Spawn Network. The script is very simple as you can see. We are just referencing the game objects that are representing the prefabs for the NPC and also inventory items prefab. Attach the new script to the spawn enemy prefab in the hierarchy window. Within this script, we have to fill all the required data such as enemy prefab, spawn location, inventory item prefab and shield. In this video, we learned how to network enable the player character. In the next video, we will test the network enabled PC and NPC. Hello guys, we are now in the new video, testing our network enabled PC and NPC. In the previous video, we saw how to network enable the RPG characters. In this video, we will be launching two instances of the build. Then, we will be using the Unity IDE to connect the third client and one of the client's instances to attack the NPC. Finally, we will learn how to pause the editor and inspect the variables. At this point, we have all of the assets needed to test out our network enabled RPG characters. There is one final step that you need to perform if you have not done so already. Select the Network Manager game object in the hierarchy window and from the inspector window you will need to make sure the following have been assigned in the spawn info section. Player prefab should be assigned to your player character prefab. Mine is named PC-CC Network-1. Make sure Auto Create Player is set true. You will also register your NPC prefabs and other network enabled non-character prefabs. In the registered spawnable prefabs, I have the Barbarian prefab named B1-Network-1 assigned, Barbarian Helmet and Shield. Alright, at last we can do a build. Let's go check the standalone build of our game. Make sure the current scene is in the build configuration. Go ahead and launch two instances of the build. Make one of them the host. And the other the client. This is our NPC character, this is our player character, and these are the inventory items. Now, let's create one more instance and make it as client. So this is the client and player 2. This is the host and player 1. This is the NPC. Keeping both of the instances running, use the Unity IDE to connect the third client. You can use the client to perform debugging on the client end and also seeing what's going on. Now, let's run the game. You can see the third client right here. Here, you can see all of the player characters and how they have been accurately synchronized with one another. Select B1-Network-1 game object from the hierarchy window and use one of the client's instances to take the player character. We are going to pause the editor and inspect the variables and how they have been properly synchronized. In this video, we successfully tested the network enabled characters. In the next video, we will see what to expect in the later parts of the game. Hey, welcome to the last video of this section as well as the course. In the previous video, we tested the network enabled characters. In this video, we are going to revise various things that we learned throughout the section, and then we will see what's more to explore. As you witnessed, network programming is simple, but at the same time it can be difficult. The difficulty is going to be on managing and understanding the synchronization of the data between all players in an efficient and meaningful way. 
it can actually get a bit more involved if you are truly considering creating a game with large numbers of clients. Unity Networking will not be able to handle that. You will need to create your own backend server managers and messaging systems. What we've covered in this section will give you a good understanding to take it to the next level. Now, let's have a look at our game. In this video, we recollected all the topics that we learned so far and how they will help us in the future. In this section, we started the chapter by giving some of the challenges that you will face as a game designer. Then we built our first example of a simplified multiplayer game, discussed the fundamentals of Unity's networking components and created a simple tank game. By the end of this video, we created new network enabled scripts to handle the character movement and close the video by discussing how to debug your code. Amazing, that was a great journey. I hope you learned many interesting concepts in the course. So keep coding until we meet again.